All right, everybody. Well, uh, that is the uh, election segment here on the show. So it's now time to uh, do the impact report. So, Vinny, do the honors. Impact was a show. It was fine. Had a memorial graphic for Brad Armstrong. It was very nice. Joseph Park opened the show in the ring. Mm -hmm. By the way, before we even start, i got to talk about this since it's the theme of the whole show. If anybody from Impact is listening... It has any power whatsoever. I beg of you. Please, even, I know I'm asking a lot to ask you to do something just for me, but I figure I'd just try. Please come up with some logical explanation for who, why each person gets to come out and call out whoever they want. You know what I mean? Is it is it first come, first served? Why isn't everybody waiting by the curtain and rushing out to get their chance to call out who they want to call out? You know? I don't know. Yeah. At the very least, it could be like everybody everybody picks a ball out of a tumbler or everybody spins a wheel or it, it's, it's picked at random with a, a complicated algorithm on a computer program. I don't care. Just tell me why Joe Park is allowed to come out and call somebody out. But, for example... I don't know. Any uh, uh, Brooke the, Tessmacher wasn't sure. allowed to come out. Right. Where was Brooke Tess? Why wasn't Brooke Tessmacher allowed to come out and call somebody out? I'm sure she's got a, a beef with somebody. It's it's absolutely completely random, and uh, in my the logical part of my brain will not accept that. I have to know why some people are allowed to come out and other people are not. It doesn't seem fair to me. So I would. I don't hate open fight night as much as I used to because there's a lot less shit going on now. They, they actually made that change, and it was for the better. Remember, they used to have, like, open fight night and gut check and championship third all on the same night, and it was a complete mess. So they took off championship Thursdays, moved it to another day. They kind of have broken down gut check a little bit, and now open fight night is kind of its own show. But still, it's like Daniels and Kassarian came out and got to call out anybody, and it was like, well, why didn't, um, you know, why didn't another tag team get to come out? Why did Daniels and Kazarian get to do this? So that's what I thought I would throw out there. So Joe Park's in the ring, and uh, he is phenomenal playing the gimmick of a guy who's not really a wrestler and doesn't actually know what's going on. Like, the, 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 the shows the cheering fans, and they're paying the crowd, and it cuts to Joe, and he's standing in the ring looking a little confused, and he says, not under the mic, can I talk now? And they give him a thumbs up, and he begins to cut his promo. And he says he's not a wrestler, he's a lawyer, but more importantly, he's a man. He's going to stick up for himself. He said Hogan and TNA did not approve his waiver, clearing them of liability for a mat, for a, to wrestle a match, but this was open fight night, and he could call out anyone. I guess he's an employee. He called out one, any one member of Aces and Eights. You're missing the best part of this entire promo. Oh, go, ahead, go ahead. He explains, and by the way, Joe Park, Todd Martin, same guy. I'm convinced. Except that I've met them both. But anyway... Joe Park explains that he wanted to fight someone in Aces and Eights, but Hogan wouldn't give him permission. Now, the, how he determined that he could call someone out tonight was, as he explained, after a great deal of investigation at Park, Park, and Park. A great deal of investigation yes. to determine that anyone could call out anybody in Ultimate Fight Night. This is what the legal firm did all week. Yeah, I can only imagine their rates, the speed with which they work. So four men came down. Kurt Angle came out to even the odds, then Sting came out with his bat. They cleared the ring, and Sting said someone was getting unmasked tonight. And that was that. Mm -hmm. We had Jesse from Big Brother. He was bitching to Tara about having to fight ODB tonight. They were rubbing him down with hand sanitizer to ensure he didn't catch a disease. Yes. That was funny. What the hell? That was a cat rushing into a room to eat. Uh, yeah, that was a... Violently, I would say. That little runt, the smallest cat we have, is by far the loudest. <laughs> that cat is so loud. I, mean, I think that people listening to the show probably heard that cat freaking out out there waiting for its food. Crazy little devil. Yeah. So speaking of calling people out, Magnus came out. All right. Magnus fought Joe at the last pay-per-view. He lost. 
So here he calls out Samoa Joe. I believe he said he wanted a TV title shot. He explained that Joe did not have the right image to be a TV champion. He said Joe was like Howard Stern and that he, he, and that he had a face made for radio. Howard Stern has a TV show that has so many more viewers than Impact Us. Just want to throw that out there. So Joe came out. They had a match. And they were running information on how to donate to the Red Cross for Hurricane Sandy relief. That was nice. So Magnus called out Joe because he wanted to win the TV championship. Well, I think the idea was he felt if he beat him in a non-title match, he would get a championship match. Okay, still. He calls him out with the goal of getting a victory. Yes. He then proceeds to pull out a wrench and hit Joe with it right in front of the ref for the DQ. Yes. So later in the show, Joe demands a no-rules match with Magnus for the pay-per-view. So apparently this is all a trap. A cunning plan by I, Magnus. I guess. To infuriate Samoa Joe into demanding a title shot with no rules in the line. He is a criminal mastermind, this Magnus. Angle stormed into Hogan's office. He announced he wanted to fight Devon and the Aces and Eights tonight. And he said he had backup. His backup was Wes Briscoe and Garrett Bischoff. Yep. You're fucked, Kurt. You're fucked. We had a wacky segment where Jeff was putting on makeup, Jeff Hardy, and uh, we could hear his thoughts and read his mind. I love this. Do you? No, I hate it. Okay, there you go. Why, it would be one why thing, can I read Jeff's mind? I mean, it would suck anyway, but his thoughts are so... Is, is being all the right word? His thoughts are so uh, shallow. His thoughts here was that he was concerned about Austin Aries, but Aries' overconfidence would kill him. Kill him! I just think that, like, uh, there's still too much with TNA attempting to be a television show and not a wrestling show. Yeah. And I don't think people realize that Impact is not competing with other television shows. It can't. It's competing with itself. There's a lot of wrestling fans in this country. 108 million, apparently. But regardless, a lot of those people aren't watching Impact. They aren't watching Raw. But they'd like to watch, like, a good wrestling show. And so your wrestling show should be designed to bring those people back into the fold. Your, your goal is not to steal viewers from some show on HBO. Because I guarantee you that show's better. It's not like if you like Sons of Anarchy, you're all of a sudden going to start watching Impact because there's a bunch of dudes in masks. Especially if you're trying to compete with, like, you know, popular sitcoms or dramas that are, like, extremely well-written. People that like those shows aren't going to watch wrestling and stick around if it's preposterous. So, the idea that, you know, we can read Jeff Hardy's thoughts, like he's narrating his own segment, that's... This is... Wrestling fans, it's not what they're looking for on their wrestling show. They're looking for a wrestling show. If they wanted a TV show, they'd watch a TV show. They wouldn't watch a wrestling show to get their TV fix. I don't know. That's yeah. my thoughts. No, you're right. You're right about all that. It, it sucks. Daniels and Kazarian came out for a promo. And they got new music. Daniels came out dancing his way to the ring. Chris Daniels was fantastic in this segment. Chris Daniels is always awesome. Especially here. He dances down to the ring. And then as Kazarian begins to speak, Daniels is in the background just doing Hindus. Just randomly. So they teased calling out Chavo and Hernandez, but then it was a swerve, and they called out Hector Guerrero and Willie Urbina. So the Spanish announced team came down there. They tried to get out of fighting, but they kept goading Hector until his Latin uh, uh, Latin blood fire, his Latin temper got the yeah, best of him. And he, uh, yeah, he, he started fighting, and they shoved Urbina down quickly and disposed of him. They started double-teaming Hector. Until finally Chavo or Hernandez ran down to make the save. And then Daniels was awesome again because in this ring with four sides and the men who are coming to beat him up are coming down one side of the ring. He was completely indecisive on which way he should run. He turned to his right. He began to run to the ropes. Then he decided, no, wait, this is the wrong way. And he threw on the brakes and he reversed tracks and went the other direction, sliding out of the ring to safety. I think the idea was that he's such a coward 
that when fleeing the ring, he was fleeing the ring on the side that his friend wasn't on. So he had to change direction and get out on the other side so he'd have backup when he got there. Sure. I also like that uh, I think throwing on the brakes and running backwards was actually much slower than just hitting the ropes. Yes. That'd be even better, too. So it's time for gut check. It was Zima Ion versus Randy the Ram Robinson, also known as Christian York. Yeah. He looked just like Mickey Rourke here. Uh, he was orange. Orange. Large. Gigantic. Uh, a road had owned him. Problem with uh, Christian York in this match was that uh, the positives are that it's a good match. He's a very good match. He, he fit right into the roster right now. People were super into it. Yeah. The problem was just that I don't know if it was. I mean, I think obviously he was trying to make a good impression or whatever. Maybe he's already signed. I don't even know. But he's too big and he's too old to do a lot of the spots he was doing in this match. And he yeah. as he gets older and bigger, it's only going to get harder. Yeah. So he should actually be going the other way where he's doing less. Yeah. Like, if you're a good enough worker, you don't need to be doing all of this goofiness, especially if you're too big and old to actually do it and it looks good. Like, there were a couple spots there that was just like, there was I a, knew what he was doing, but you're too big and you're too old to do that There spot. was a point where Ion threw a kick, and he caught it, threw the foot down, and then hit the uh, somersault kick like uh, Liger and other guys have done. Only it took him like an hour. It was not like Liger. He did a slow somersault and bonked into the guy. Yeah. But, I mean, overall, he did... Uh, he he, uh, he It was looked, good. Yeah, he was good. He, he could fit on the roster all full-time next week, and it would be totally fine. That being said, he lost. Uh, Ion put him in his wacky armbar submission, and, uh, and that was that. That would be interesting to do someday where the gut check guy beats the other guy. And then it's like, well, you know, these are all his downsides, these are all his... But he just beat this guy. Yeah. You know, how can you... And that could be the big argument they have. Well, how can we say how can we say no to uh to How can we say Christian he's not good York enough? When he just beat our champion. Yes. Who's not our champion, but if he was. Aries did a backstage promo saying he was he still considered himself the champion and the star, and that's why he was carrying the old title belt around. He went into Robbie E's locker room for a secret meeting, and he closed the door, and the door had a great big giant dent in it, because TNA is a cheap-ass rinky-dink company. Well, this would actually be the impact zone. You can blame uh, Universal Studios for this door. Garrett Bischoff assured Bully Ray that he had Ray's back. Ray thanked him, essentially, and treated him with equal respect. Forgetting the few they had. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, there was noise outside. They ran out, and a giant brawl broke out between the Team TNA and Team Aces and Eights. The highlight of this was they zoomed in on Kurt Angle, and he was throwing body shots to one guy like he was underwater. Just slow-moving arms coming up way short of the body. My first reaction was, this is how Kurt plays wrestling in the backyard with his kids. Then I thought about it, and I said, that if, if Kurt Angle was training his children to wrestle... They would have a much harder time with things than this. We had ODB versus Jesse. ODB cut a promo on Jesse, and uh, ironically, considering the debate that opened the show. This was a great segment, by the way. <laughs> ODB was making fun of Jesse for things like eating healthy and training well. Yeah. <laughs> Taking care of himself. These are bad things in ODB's world. So Jesse came out. We all know he's got a great body. He's also got real gear. And he's at least trained. I was expecting some uh, uh, girl from Survivor amateur hour stuff. He's been in Ohio Valley training for a while. Yeah, he, he's he looked fine. Had a total comedy match. He's also been working, I'm sure, a million matches with Odie. They, they may have gone over this move for move 500 times. Fine. It worked. Uh, almost all ODB's offense and comedy. Finally, she missed uh, uh, Thez Press, I think. Some kind of dive. And uh, Jesse gave her one body slam, and he went over the ropes to celebrate with Tara. And he turned around, and ODB slammed him, spanked him. She was then distracted by Tara. Jesse schoolboyed her and won. Not a fast count, just just a one, just a win. And as soon as uh, the ref counted three, he got up to celebrate as ODB remained trapped on her shoulders with her legs out over her head. Yes. Bicycle kicking in the air, trying to turn over like a turtle. Yes. That really made this awesome. Yeah. I enjoyed this whole segment. This is a totally fine comedy match. And we're going to get a, probably a pretty fun mixed tag when all is said and done. Tara and uh, Jesse Goddard 
have ended up a, a perfectly fine duo. Like uh, Matt Morgan and uh, and uh, what's his face? Uh, Joey Ryan. Joey Ryan. This needs work. But uh, Tara and Jesse Goddard are great together. So we had the second hour. Uh, Mike Tanay took over for Todd Keneally at the, annou- the announce desk. Borash stuck around because Taz was back in Long Island cleaning up his house after the storm. Robbie E. came down and called out Jeff Hardy. Apparently this was his master plan that Austin Aries had talked him into. He pointed out that he had beat Jeff in the Bound for Glory series. He may have been the last man to beat Jeff Hardy in a match, but he did not get a title shot, and here he had to go. He, he had to come down here and call Jeff out. So it was basically a squash. Robbie got just enough offense that Jeff could make a comeback. He pinned him with a senton. Crowd loved this. And they loved Jeff Hardy. I am fine with champions winning squash matches just because they're champions. That's great. Aries came out and cut a promo and talked about how he had started at the bottom and climbed the ladder to the top of TNA. So Jeff pulls the ladder out from under the ring and begins to climb it. Aries was appalled and outraged by this. It was a metaphor, he cried. And uh, Jeff demanded a ladder match at the pay-per-view, but Aries said, no, hell no, he's not doing this, and he stormed off. He had footage from the opening of Hogan's Beach Shop. Mm. This was wacky. (laughs) Hulk was talking about how great it was to see all these people. And as he was speaking, suddenly Matt Morgan interrupted. So he's going to show Hogan something. He grabbed a cape off the wall. Hogan begged him not to take it. Said, that's the cape I wore in Shea Stadium. That's my property. Morgan said, don't embarrass yourself by trying to stop me. And he walked out. My first thought was, wow, I can't believe Hogan let himself show that much weakness. That's the whole thing. It's like, I just saw Hulk Hogan... With one punch, take out eight members of Aces and Eights. Mm-hmm. And now this dingbat comes in and steals, uh, like, a legitimately, if that were the real robe, which I doubt it was, I mean, that is actually a a, a piece of wrestling history. And uh, and Hogan just backed down like a, a coward. Yeah. Well, the ne- very next shot was Hogan watching the same footage in the Impact Zone, nodding to himself, saying, he's figuring it out. So Hogan, for some reason, is uh, motivated by all this to manipulate Morgan into a killer. Mm. So as he was watching this, up walks James Storm. Now, let's review from his some history to set up the next segment or a segment later down the, in the show. James Storm was the leading point getter in the Bound for Glory Series tournament, but he uh, was... I think he was knocked out of the tournament by Robert Roode. Point is, he he defeated Robert Roode in their grudge match. He won the feud. He got his revenge. It was time to move on. And then last week, he was in contention for a title shot, but Hogan chose Kurt Angle instead because he said he had plans for Storm. That happened last week. So here, James Storm walks up and Hogan says, "Hey, let's go. Let's uh, come talk to me. I got an idea for you." Yes. So in seven days, apparently he had not shared this idea with James Storm. James Storm looked as confused as I was. There's a uh, commercial for the uh, website, the, the merchandise website, that has the TNA guys dressed up like zombies. Seen it many times before, but I have never noticed before that zombie Chris Daniels has painted on abs. <laughs> yeah, He's awesome. Rude came out for a promo. He said that he was, uh, now that Austin Aries was no longer champion... That meant he was eligible to get a title shot again. He talked about kicking Jeff's ass until AJ interrupted. AJ then pointed out that the uh, WWE was ripping off the Claire Lynch storyline and even had a character named AJ in it. Eventually, he called Root out. They brawled a bit, but the match never really started. Then James, uh, James Storm and Hulk Hogan came out. Hogan said that AJ and Root both deserve title shots. He's going to give them a chance to earn one. For the pay-per-view, he was booking a three-way with AJ versus Rude versus Storm. The winner gets a title shot, and the man who loses the fall cannot get a title shot until Bound for Glory in 2013. I hope it's not another long year for James Storm. This was Hogan's big plan for James Storm. Yeah. I'm going to take you out of a title match now and put you in a three-way, including a guy you already beat... 
And you're at risk of not getting a title shot for 11 more months. Hell of a plan. James Storm is getting fucked in the ass by Hulk Hogan here. That's what's happening. This storyline's horrible. Speaking of horrible things, Joey Ryan and Matt Morgan. Yeah. I like the idea of Joey Ryan. I like the idea. It's timeless. Small, cowardly guy standing behind Big Giant. Yeah. However, Joey Ryan is like, he does a porn star gimmick. And his giant is a guy who's pretending he's Hulk Hogan from 1979. Yeah. Or 1980. It's two, it, yeah, they're not, it, it, it's two random gimmicks cutting promos in the ring at the same time. And Morgan in that outfit is so goofy. The keep? Oh, God. Yeah. And uh, it's actually hysterical because he's standing there in the cape and uh, Ryan has to hold the mic for him because it's a cape. And he holds the mic up way too high. And you can actually hear Morgan say, down. And Ryan drops the mic down and Morgan starts, starts to talk. And eventually he gets fed up and he can't take it anymore. He grabs the mic away. <laughs> so the point of all this was he's going to beat up everyone and win the world title. I don't buy this. <laughs> no. All these years, it's still the same Matt Morgan. Yes. Generic promos, tall, hasn't improved a lick in the ring in about 10 years. I just, I, 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 I don't see the Matt Morgan deal. And uh, and we talked about how the it's two gimmicks with nothing, nothing in common forced together. There's not even a storyline reason for them to be hooking up. Why did Matt Morgan help Joey Ryan? Why does he care? I have absolutely no idea. So, Joey called out RVD. He vowed to make the X title X-rated. God, I hope not. Had a match. Rob squashed him the entire time. Goes for the frog splash. Morgan pulls Ryan out of the way. Ryan then hit what I think was supposed to be an Oklahoma roll for what I think was supposed to be the pin. He may have been supposed to hook the ropes or the tights or something, but no, he pinned Rob Van Dam basically clean. I think he was supposed to get the ropes, and then when he didn't get the ropes, they claimed he grabbed the tights. I see. So this is a non-title match. I guess now you can call anyone out, but they can't be title matches, I guess. So Rob was he sprung to his feet. He was confused and hurt. and he That is correct, by the way. You can only call out the champion on champion, but whatever. So RVD turns around, and there's Matt Morgan hitting a very badly timed carbon footprint. Which just can makes him at this point look like a bad Seamus knockoff. Nothing good about this segment at all. Bully Ray came out. He had New York tributes in his wrist tape. Wished everyone in the Northeast well. Stay hardcore, he told them. Called out Devon. We had Bully Ray versus Devon. Devon Dudley is in far and away the best shape of his life. Not just his career, I think. His life. He's wearing a tank top. It's it's not like Under Armour, but it's pretty it's pretty snug, and uh, yeah, he's he's lean. So they wrestled a bit. Devon soon called for reinforcements. Eight masked men came down. Sting and all his buddies came down. Ray and Devon had a brief confrontation in the ring. Then one of the larger Aces and Eights dudes knocked them both out. And then uh, Joe Park ran in. He wanted to fight this big guy. He put up his Dukes. He was still wearing his glasses, and the big guy just punched him in the stomach and dropped him. Yep. <laughs> He's Joe Park. Yep. He's not a wrestler. So the big guy's working him over and beating him up, and suddenly Joe reaches up and yanks the mask off, and it's Luke Gallows. And the crowd went. Yeah. So Gallows was pissed. He chokeslammed Park through the table. They attempted to explain he was one of the biggest stars in wrestling. They, they, what they called him was an enforcer for some of the biggest names of the business. I see. Yes. I see. But they still couldn't say his name they or say any his name or even derivative of a name. Or that this guy used to be, or yeah, or nothing like that. They just said he, they essentially said he was an employee of big stars. Mm -hmm. So Gallows put Park through a table. They all ran away, and that was the end of the show. It felt more newsworthy than most impacts. Well, certainly more newsworthy than last week. Past couple weeks have sucked. I have not been on the show in a while, but yeah. That's right. This is your first Thursday back in a while. Yeah. I've forgotten about that. Everyone forgot. <laughs> so yeah, that was Impact, everybody. 
And yes, there's a difference. If any championship Thursday, a championship is on the line. But this open fight night, you can't challenge for a title match. But you can't challenge a champion. It's not for the title. Got all that? I don't care. I just like them to please explain who gets uh, to call someone. I am so. I'm beyond caring. It's been. How long has it been? Six months more? It has been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. Clearly, they're never going to. Well, they have made some changes. They did make a few positive changes. Mm. I like that one day where uh, the best, the best, the best they ever did was the night where it was a Bound for Glory tournament, close to the finals, and it was like uh, everybody in the last, in the final four, whatever, final eight, whatever it was, all those guys get the chance to call someone out, and I was like, great, that makes sense. Now I understand why Bully Ray gets to call somebody out and Kurt Angle doesn't. That was great. Let's uh, get going on impact. Somebody left a note saying, or a comment saying that number twelve Santa is badass. That is the Santa who is wearing a cat on top of him. Yes. Or perhaps a cat is in the process of eating him. We're not sure. Oh my god! I can't. I shouldn't click this, but I'm gonna. Is it the forty-five drunk Santa's link? No, fifty people you wish you knew in real life. For example, there's a fella here who has a gigantic bag of Lucky Charms marshmallows. Nice. Where's this link? I missed that one. It's down at the bottom. There's a there is a picture here of a black fella standing on a corner, and he has five dogs all wearing sunglasses. I didn't get this ad. Bummer. Yes. <laughs> the most awesome photograph I have ever seen. Here's a car where somebody is, uh, apparently it's like 100 degrees out, so they put uh, a, a pan full of cookie dough on the dash. Excellent. To cook. Yeah. Here's a little girl standing next to a monkey, and they're both looking at each other in the identical fashion, clearly not trusting each other. This is awesome. All right, let's go on. I found that list. I'll go look at it later. Go Impact. down. Scroll down to number five. Number five. Marshmallow bad guy. A party with Neil Patrick Harris and Christina Hendricks. The dogs in the sunglasses, cookies on the dash, <laughs> the child and the monkey. Oh my god, go down to number 11. A camel is eating a child's head. That probably sounded way worse than I'm hoping it actually is. No, no, you're right. That camel there is devouring a child's head. I presume this ended up all right, because this is on a comedy page. I don't think the camel actually bit the child's head off. But that does look like... what. Could potentially be a life-changing experience for that child. Or life-ending. I don't know about life-ending, Vinny. Come on. Dude, a camel's eating his head. Go down to 13. I saw that one, too. Is that Kevin Von Eric? <laughs> Isn't it? Oh, I bet this is really awesome radio. <laughs> I don't care. It's my show. They can find this. Oh, God. BuzzFeed.com. People you wish you knew in real life. <laughs> Wow. Whoever you eat after trick or treaters. I like uh, number 17. <laughs> Man with bizarre name arrested. Oh, yeah, I remember this. Bees out, doo doo, zoppity bop, bop, bop. Yes, he was arrested. Yeah. I like whoever loves Wendy's this much. Someone left a review on Google. This place is ballin', yo. Chicken nuggets be crispy like you've never seen. I tasted one and I was like, what? Are you serious, Wendy? Mean Girls working the fryers yet, though. This one chick wouldn't even let me holla. I was like, please, you ugly anyway. Oh, Vinny. All right, seriously, we got to get going here. <laughs> Where do these Basset Hounds belong to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Scroll down to 33. Is it the cat? 33. No. 33. Hang on. <laughs> a man has pushed his pug down a slide, and the pug is not happy. It looks exactly like the Looney Tunes logo. It's a red circle with an animal flying at you. Oh my god, 35, it's your running mate. <laughs> that looks exactly like Anchor, shaving abs into himself. Shaving abs in. I like 39. Whoever this luchador riding a motorcycle while riot police fire tear gas at him is... <laughs> That's what's happening. 
<laughs> have we clicked these links? <laughs> 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 What's that? <laughs> Number forty-four. The kid in the in the front on the far left. <laughs> His fist high in the air. <laughs> Very happy riding the raft. Oh my God. One squirrel, one cup. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Oh god! All right, we got to move on. Move on, Vinny. I got to stop looking. Hey, at Hey, one of these photos I've actually seen before. Do the impact report. The impact is good. Let's go look at more photos. <laughs> this one, too. I just put it on my Facebook. <laughs> and Nicholas Cage. Fine. All right. I'm oh, closing that God. window. Oh, this is why... That's one of the things I look, I look at when you're talking to Granny. Ace is an eight for pissed at Luke Gallows because he got his mask taken off. And see, so he was not even a full member yet. And here he had lost his mask. Gave him one week to prove that he could earn, earn a spot in the group. Devon said they should accept Hulk Hogan's challenge to face Sting and Kurt Angle, and Luke Gallows said fine. AJ Styles wrestled Bobby Roode. What we had here in the opener of Impact was a three-plus star pay-per-view quality match for no reason, and I'm fine with that. James Storm was on commentary. They were stressing that the loser of the three-way on Sunday does not get a title shot for a year. Uh, Rude grabbed a chair, Storm went down to stop him from using it, but AJ told him to mind his own business, and then AJ got tripped up and pinned. This was fun. The uh, other highlight was Bobby Rude's fake tan, leaving orange smears all over uh, AJ's body. Oh my body. god, this was preposterous. It was like he was part of it. It was like he was a, a, a pumpkin for Halloween and just kept the uh, orange all over him. Yeah. Aries had a confrontation with Hogan. Hogan told him to return the title belt by the end of the show. That did not make Aries any happier. Sting and Angle tried to teach Wes Briscoe about timing. Am I wrong about that? That's exactly what happened. All right. Joseph Park came to the ring. He begged Hogan for a match against the Aces and Eights. Hogan came out, was about to say no, and Bully Ray came down. And Bully Ray cut a promo vouching for Joe Park. Said this man has proved his toughness, and he's proven he has what it takes to fight these men. And... Hulk finally agreed, and Joe gave him a big hug, so presumably it'll be Joe versus someone at the pay-per-view. Well, they actually announced later it'd be Luke Gallows. Oh, well, there you go. Jesse from Big Brother is quickly growing on me. He uh, was bragging about all the moves he hit on ODB last week, including, quote, a super double tiger driver. Cool. I don't remember that. Uh, that happened. The move. Oh. Uh, ODB arrived. She said Eric Young was not there, but she was challenging them to a two-on-one match anyway. Storm and AJ shouted at each other backstage for a bit. ODB versus Tara and Jesse. She beat them up for several minutes by herself, and then she pinned Tara clean. Well, yep. There's uh, going to be an unfortunate animated gif on our board from where ODB was standing in the corner, jumping up and down and patting her vagina. The heels attacked her afterwards. They opened her flask like they were going to take a drink, and then they poured it all over her, and it appeared to be ketchup in there. Or something. Red wine? Straight grenadine? Mm -hmm. Not sure. Kool-Aid? Something very red came out of this flask. ODB was backstage, shouting Eric over the phone, because the heels had poured her liquid all over her. That's what she called it. Liquid. My liquid! liquid. They poured my liquid all over me. She demanded that Eric show up at the pay-per-view for a tag team match. Al Snow's jacket appeared on television. We talk about gut check, but it's more important to talk about Al Snow's jacket. It's all anyone else could talk about. It was like shiny powder blue paisley. And where on earth he found this? But uh, remember, I once said I wanted to do the uh, I want I wanted a segment that was just Dave Batista goes clothes shopping. Mm -hmm. I want one even more for Al Snow. They may go together. No. Batista probably wore something like this, but he's he's cool, so you didn't notice. I, I think the difference is, and this is a big difference, Batista spends a lot more money in his clothes. Yeah. Al probably found this for like $35. I said, bargain! In fact, probably a lot less than that. I want I, Dave would go to like the... The ritziest shopping center you ever saw, where there's a personal assistant to walk around and, and take note of everything you want to try. 
and Al will just go to flea markets and haggle with people. You're asking $35 for this powder blue paisley jacket. I will give you 25 <laughs> <laughs> We had Sting and Angle versus Devon and Doc. Doc would be Luke Gallows. Yeah. His name is short for Director of Chaos, which frankly is a much cooler name than Doc. They had a perfectly fine tag team match. Uh, Devon attacked uh, Sting with a baseball bat for the DQ. Buddy Ray hit the ring. He went to lay out Devon and grabbed a table. Devon fled. Ray pursued him. Then a bunch of other aces and ace geeks ran out. They attacked Sting and Kurt. They bonked Sting with a hammer. They put him through a table. And they gave Doc the hammer. And it was his time to prove that he belonged in the gang. So he hit Sting repeatedly all over the body. And both hands with his hammer. And he's working him over. Working him over. And then just as all the heel, uh, baby faces come out to make the save. He bonked Sting right in the head. I know it was a gimmicked hammer. But ow. He beat the piss out of this guy. Yeah. They showed like a thousand replays. Yes, yes. And uh, this was like the best beaten I've seen anybody give anybody in a long time. At least like a on impact. Actually, really anywhere. I guess I guess if you count like the uh, the the Bobby Roode James Storm match of the pay per view, just because of all the blood and everything, that was a better beaten. But uh, he beat the hell out of this guy with this hammer. And they they made a point of you know there was no to the back moment here. No. They let this beating sink in. They showed uh, the, the baby faces running out making the save. They showed the geeks helping Sting very slowly walk to the back. Uh, then they went to commercial. When they came back, they showed replays of virtually everything. Yeah. This was a big deal. They clearly love Luke Gallows. And uh, as soon as he destroyed Sting, I mean, this was like, you rarely see anybody lay out Sting like this. So maybe sometimes someone will hit their finish or anything, but this was like he beat this man to death with this hammer in this angle, and uh, and then later on in the show they they showed the preview for the pay per view, and it was it was uh, Joe Park versus Luke Gallows, and I was like, uh oh, poor Joe Park. You don't think he's gonna make the saver sting? No, <laughs> no. I I just think of the beating that I'm sure that. Uh, Joe Park is willing to take for Luke Gallows to get the dude Ooh, over. Well, and after what, uh, yeah. <laughs> what after what they do with Sting, it was like, man, this could be a long night for Joe Park. He's going to get put through like a, a meat grinder. They'll just run him over. Yeah. Time for Christian York's gut check. They very quickly said yes. Taz said yes. Pritchard very, very briefly teased, saying no. Uh, you're talking about how he'd, he had been in, in the business for this long and hadn't broken out yet. And then he says, but here's your chance. And he said yes. They didn't even ask Al and his jacket what they thought. Krishna cut a nice promo about how dreams come true. This was good because it was about time they had a guy that uh, everyone just agreed you're in. Yeah. And, you know, he, based on the other people we'd seen, there was absolutely no reason for him to not get the job. I did like how they were talking about how uh, you've been in this business 16 years, and uh, why haven't you made it anywhere? And their conclusion, Bruce Pritchard's conclusion, was you've never gotten a chance. And it was like, wasn't he on the first ever TNA? That's what they said. What happened to him? Because it appears he got a chance then and then disappeared into obscurity. But we'll see how he does this time around. There is a weird short segment where Aries passed by Brooke Hogan and Bully Ray having a conversation. I had no idea what was going on here, but you concluded that they were going to make Brooke and Bully Ray a couple. Well, I got a, uh, I got a weird text like uh, three or four days ago, and it wasn't from anybody in TNA, but uh, it was about... Bully and Brooke had been seen on a date, and uh, I didn't get any more details. Like, you know, was it was it something that was filmed for storyline? Was it was it something that really happened in Tampa? I, I I was just like baffled. And then when I saw the the show tonight, and there was a very very brief Bully Brooke Hogan moment. It was like split second, and they were gone. 
I was like, oh, huh. So I think I think that's going to be a storyline. That's my thought. I actually have no idea what they're doing, but I, that's the impression that I got based on information I received earlier in the week. Now, this thought did not occur to me, but simply because even having tried to process it, that's about the weirdest couple you can think of. Yeah. Hogan met with Joey Ryan and Matt Morgan in his office. And by the way, oh. the text uh, noted that there was a video. I don't know where. I don't. I don't think it was on TMZ. I mean, maybe I'm out of the loop and this is all over the place, but I haven't seen anything about it, so it was just very strange. Hogan banned Morgan from Joey Ryan's match against RVD on Sunday. Morgan cut an angry promo about how Hogan had no idea what he was messing with, and they left, and Hogan smirked, and he's, he's pulling the strings. We had a six-man, Magnus and Daniels and Kazarian versus Joe and Chavo Hernandez. Long match, plenty of time. Got the heat on Chavo, and then Hernandez made a comeback, and then Joe made his comeback, and Hernandez, who nearly killed himself in a house show doing his giant dive, here he is an impact a week later doing his giant dive. It's scarier than ever now. But uh, eventually the heels isolated Joe. The world tag team champions of the world had a double team move on him. A uh, high-low move. And Magnus finished him off with a top rope elbow. So TNA has caught on to the WWE thing where they need to have a six-man on every show because it's almost always a good match and you can have a clean winner without burying anyone. It took three men to beat Joe. So there you go. By the way... Mm. I did a little Googling, and uh, nothing comes up when you look for Brooke Hogan and Bully Ray. However, uh, there is a there is a page that, uh, in discussing various editions of Impact, notes that at the end of August 2012, so about three months ago, apparently there was an angle where Brooke Hogan was being attacked... And a bunch of TNA guys ran out to make the save. And the first one out was Bully Ray. So this actually might have been something that they've been slowly, quietly building for like three months now. And no one has noticed. Slow build. That is a slow build. Hmm. More to come. Bully hope so. Rude cut a promo bragging about getting AJ and Storm to fight each other. Said he would win the match on Sunday. Then it's time for the main event promo. Aries came down. Said nothing for a few minutes. Basically saying he would win. The crowd was giving him the what treatment. He called them idiots and told them to listen because he was speaking English. He dared Jeff to come down and get the bell from him. Jeff Hardy, the world heavyweight wrestling champion, appeared on stage in like Vans shoes, skater shorts, and a pink hoodie. He hit the ring. They brawled. Both guys tried their finishers but missed. Aries finally fled. So Hardy hung both belts above the ring. He climbed the ladder to pose, but then Aries returned to knock the ladder over and beat him up some more, and then he posed. And that was that. Yeah, there's a pay-per-view this Sunday, everybody, believe That's it or not. not. That can't be true. 6,500 buys, my prediction. That seems awfully high. After uh, 20,000 for Bound for Glory. Yeah. Yeah, they've, they've done a bad job of building this. They're obsessed with... I'm, it's the same story, different month, but... They're obsessed with the Aces and Eight storyline, which is, in fact, never the top match in the pay-per-view. Yeah. Well, so, they're they're working their way up. I guess. They're working their way up. Ace and Eight is a million times better, now that we know who the, one of the guys is. Two of the guys, actually. At least there are some faces here. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They did a good job getting... Uh, uh, we know Devon and Doc. Doc. They did a good job getting him over this week, and we know Devon. So it's more than just uh, a bunch of faceless geeks. And I think that uh, that's obviously a positive. But show is much better this week, I'll say that. All right, uh, the TNA uh, program pay-per-view. I thought the TNA pay-per-view as a whole was a pretty pretty uh, middle-of-the-road show. Kind of thumbs thumbs in the middle, leaning down, just because when you buy a pay-per-view, you don't want to see a bunch of matches that are fine. 
You want to see good matches? And then it was, uh, I thought the show was saved by what was a very good, but very, very, very violent main event. And uh, the two men in that match beat the fuck out of each other for my amusement. Uh, I thought it was at least a thumbs in the middle because you also had the three-way. I thought the first, remember we, we had, I felt about the three-way the same way you felt about the Seamus Big Show match. Where the first half of it was just completely boring. And then the, the finish was great. But the uh, show opened with Magnus and Joe. It was fine. It was a fun match. Two and three quarter stars. Wow. Yeah. They uh, were do- doing kicking out of a lot of finishers here in this opener. And uh, Magnus hit his elbow twice, which is better than CM Punk's. And Joe kicked out. And Magnus kicked out of Muscle Buster. An ODQ match where they did almost no no DQ stuff. A chair got used once or twice. And uh, finally, Joe hooked on the choke. And Matt is going to escape, and that was the end. I do like that this time he put on the choke, and in fact, uh, he got the win quickly afterwards. It was funny because uh, Todd Keneally was, it was, it was Keneally, Tanae, and Taz on, on commentary. And uh, <laughs> Keneally, the old school pro wrestling announcer, says, uh, the ref will now drop his arm three times, and if it drops three times, the match is over. And the ref dropped his arm once and called for the bell. Yeah. Times change. Well, it's perfect. It's completely random. In the rules of mutual combat, it is not specified whether it's dropping once or three times. It's up to the discretion of the referee. I suppose. Do you know that? That's a fact, Vinny. Hmm. Are you serious? I made it up. Okay. You might have looked it up in front of you. ODB. In what rule book? Uh, the, 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 the law. I got a copy of the the rule the pro wrestling rule book you here You have a computer with the internet. You can type in Seattle mutual combat law. And Okay. I don't know. <laughs> now, the, this this is why this show is awesome. Let's see. I don't think we've got. Uh, see now, not only getting our articles about this thing, mm. I know the actual. I don't have the actual law here, but uh, the point is, I doubt in the mutual combat law there's there's anything involving how many times the arm has to drop before the fight's over. Well, perhaps it can be revised. ODB and Eric Young wrestled Tara and Jesse. I love that as part of the heels entrance, Jesse military presses Tara a few times to warm up. That is awesome. So they did a complete comedy match. Comedy was funny enough. The action was fine enough. A lot of the comedy involved ODB's breasts and or her vagina. Highlight was Taryn Terrell. It's been a while since I've really noticed her. I've kind of gotten used to her. Kind of maybe got a little numb to her. But there was a point. Actually, all, all her pinfalls, she counted the same way. Where she drops down to, to, to both knees in one hand. And she raises her arm high in the air. She arches her back as far as, as far as she can. And then she slaps the mat and counts one. And she does that twice. And then, of course, they kick out. And uh, completely unnatural and forced. And then she hops up to her feet. And she just starts stepping back and forth. I can't even say shifting her weight from side to side. She's just step left, step right, step left, step right, step step left, step right. Repeat, repeat, repeat. So eventually, Jesse got uh, ODB's flask, spat into his face, and he got kicked in the nuts. And then Eric pinned him with his elbow drop, which is actually much better than Magnus's. So uh, ODB and Eric won. Now, I know there's a story about this in the Observer. I'm not ready yet. Is he gone now? Hold on a second. Oh, God. What have I done? So, I didn't find mutual combat, but I'm looking at a test. I don't even know where I found this, but it is it is about killing folks, the law. And this here says, to get your charges reduced from first or second degree murder to manslaughter, you must pass all of the following tests to show that your crime was not premeditated. And there are there are some examples here. Look at these examples that they that they came up with. This is you discovered your spouse committing adultery. So it's going to give an example, and you have to decide whether this is uh, provocation or not. 
So here we go. Mary walks in on her husband, Jeff, having an affair with her younger sister. She and her sister share everything, so she doesn't mind. However, she is mad that her sister forgot to pick her up from the airport this morning, so she shoots her. (laughs) This Vinny is listed as no actual provocation. You must get taught on the show to talk about this. (laughs) Now, here's the other example. Mary walks in on her husband, Jeff, having an affair with her younger sister. She is furious, panics, and throws the TV over her sister's head. Her sister dies. Yes, this is actual provocation. Because the actions were in response to the adultery. What is this thing? My God. How about that? It's a handout. This must be for a class. So we've got a bunch of questions here. What is this? It's baffling to me. Criminal Law Trivia Olympics and Valentine's Day lesson. Valentine's Day, you say? Oh, my God. Wow. All right. Well, let's move on here. I've, I I could take no more of this. Joey and Ryan wrestled Rob Van Dam. Mm-hmm. Still amazing to me. I'm watching Joey Ryan cut ho- promos on Hulk Hogan. That's just bizarre. So they had a match. Mike Tenet, uh in this match and in the opener, was uh, talking about other companies guys had worked for, like Ring of Honor and ECW and WWE. Just throwing these names out there very casually. You won't believe this, but Joey Ryan got the heat in this match by pushing Rob Van Dam off the top rope. So he I know, it was the shocking. <laughs> I have never seen that spot. No, no. should also mention that before the match... Joey cut a promo saying he wanted Matt Morgan to stay in the back so he could beat Rob on his own. What a heel! And the best part was, I thought when he said this, it would be, uh, you know, he's a heel. So I thought Morgan would come out and interfere. No! Joey Ryan meant this. He wanted to fight Rob Van Dam man-to-man in mutual combat. Yeah. That's legal. (laughs) So, thank God Todd was there to identify uh, Ryan's wacky indie moves like the mustache ride. That's what he calls it. It's a neckbreaker. Rob made his comeback, one with a frog splash. Joey and Ryan looked totally fine. It was a very average match. And uh, Rob went to the top of the ramp to celebrate. And last time, I think it was also when he kicked Rob, but the last time Matt Morgan threw that carbon footprint, which is exactly the same thing as the bro kick, he was standing way too close to the guy and it looked stupid. So he comes out here to kick Rob, and sure enough, he's standing way too close to him and it looks stupid. Must be a new finisher. I suppose. We had a Joseph Park Esquire promo. He wished Sting, told him to get well soon. He admitted he was afraid to wrestle the man who administered that beating to Sting, but he was going to, going to avenge the unspeakable and unmentionable acts that the Aces and Nates had done to him while he was kidnapped. Fed him. Well. So we had Joseph Park versus Doc. It was goofy. He did a uh, live-action Bugs Bunny cartoon where Doc would charge, and Joseph Park would dodge, and Doc would bounce into something, which sounds funny enough on its own. Then you must remember, Joseph Park is significantly larger here. Few, few four inches taller and, I don't know, 100 pounds bigger? He was the much, much larger man, but he was fast. Eventually, Doc cut him off, beat him up forever. It was boring. Joe made his... uh I don't know how to wrestle comeback where he just throws clumsy forearms and then kind of hits the ropes, but he doesn't know how. Doc hit him with his belt and Joe gigged the highlight of the match because uh, Joe saw the blood in his hands and he went into a trance and he went into abyss mode, started screaming and destroying the man and hit him, laid him out with a black, black hole slam. And he trance faded. He was confused again. And uh, eventually, Doc hit him with a choke slam, which is also funny because, again, Joe is way bigger than him. Mm-hmm. Like if you choke slam me, just look silly. So Doc, Doc won. Have you seen these guns? Oh, your arms. Yeah. So uh, Doc won. Uh, he continued the assault after the match. Bully Ray came out to make the save, and he raised Joe's hand out of respect. Not much to see here. Chavo Hernandez beat Cass Daniels in a completely average tag team match. They got the heat in the little guy. 
the big guy Ryan Wild, they did a finish. Champs won. Finish was actually cool. It was a uh, a uh, doomsday device with a crossbody by Chavo. I like that move. AJ did a promo. Notre Dame has not been world champion in almost three years. Well, it's going to be four. Then we had the, the three way. What did AJ Styles do to his hair? Vinny, mm -hmm. I am certain that this was by design. The whole story of this match is AJ is slipping. Mm hmm. He's getting older, he's lost his fire, he's had a bad year, he's had distractions, can't do what he used to do anymore, and uh, the hair made the whole thing work. He's He looked so tired. <laughs> he looks like a history teacher. Disheveled. Yes. He looked like the road had absolutely owned him. It was great. He, he, AJ was so awesome on this show, I thought, being that guy. He did it perfectly. I, I even the even the spot where he he, uh, he gets thrown over the top and he just kind of slips on the apron looks like he nearly kills himself. He pulled it off without a hitch. That was all by design. He was awesome. So it was it was a three way. The uh, the first half of it, the standard one guy waits on the floor while two guys do stuff in the ring, which is fine when it's like an X division match and guys are flying through the air and kicking each other. But these guys were doing like chin locks. <laughs> And Indian deathlocks, as the other guy just waited. Three ways do not work when there's no action going on. So it was not much for a while, for a long time, in fact. And then they finally started hitting big moves at the end, and it got great. There was a cool spot where uh, Rude and Storm, like on accident, both grabbed AJ for a suplex, and they looked at each other, and they hit the suplex, and they almost could not help themselves but to complete the theatrical chant of beer money. And then the last second, they caught themselves and started fighting. I love that spot. That was great. AJ has four. Everyone hit and teased their finishers. And finally, Storm is, uh, or excuse me, Rude, is going to go for the Fisherman Suplex. But Storm hits him with a backcracker from behind. So that lays Rude, lays Rude out. But AJ is standing there stunned. And so Storm hits him with a super kick and wins. That was a great finish. So Storm gets a title shot. For the moment. <laughs> you skeptical? No, he already lost at the tapings. Great. Yeah. That's awesome. Bobby That's... Roode beat James Storm, and now James Storm wasn't even on the second set of tapings, so I don't know what the hell's going on. This fucking company. It has to be a three-way. Otherwise, they've lost their minds. <sighs> so, anyway, the point of all this is that it was never really made clear why Hulk doesn't want one of these men challenging for the title, but AJ agreed to these tips for whatever reason. He lost clean. He doesn't get a title match for a year now. Devon cut a promo on Kurt Angle from Aces and Eights Land. And they had a match. It was not very good. No. I watched this match a second time trying to figure out where Devon hurt himself, and I have no answer. Maybe he was just selling Kurt's ankle lock. No, because, <laughs> listen, that was broached to me, but number one, I know that he did tweak his knee. And uh, number two, you don't fake an injury to the point where you let your match fall apart with Kurt Angle. You know? Yeah. So, uh, Aces and Aids ran down and surround the ring. And when they did this, Kurt immediately slapped on the ankle lock in the middle. And Devon tapped, which it seems like it's been years since Kurt actually tapped someone out with that move. But uh, Devon tapped out. Way to put over this Aces and Aids. Yep. Kurt immediately ran to the back. Ace and Ace, Aces and Aces were sad, and Doc was screaming at Kurt, you're next and you're dead. So, yeah, fresh off his win after, over uh, Joe Park, Doc is now going to feud with Kurt Angle. The storyline also sucks, by the way. Just want to mention that. An, un an unidentified person tried to interview AJ. AJ blew him off in despair and walked away. And then we have the main event. It was Austin Aries and Jeff Hardy in a ladder match. They, uh, well, they beat the fuck out of each other. Hardy, in particular, a couple of times was climbing the ladder and got it uh, shoved out from under him or kicked out from under him and just took hard falls onto the mat. This guy was trying to kill himself. He, yeah. <laughs> He's been doing it for a long time, too. And those, those, the, those TLC matches with the Dudleys and Nudge and Christian were 10 years ago. Also a spot where they had the ladder uh, 
upside down but unfolded, and he threw himself ribs first onto it. That looked brutal. Onto the skinny things that hold the two sides together. Yeah. Like a knife. Yeah, don't do that, everyone. Hardy was, uh, excuse me, Aries was taking his own share of uh, stupid stuff. There was, well, for example, one point where uh, Hardy had a twist of fate off the top of the ladder and both guys splattered to the, to the earth. So the most insane one, I thought, was uh, the right of the finish. They're brawling on top of a super ladder. It's kind of hard to describe this, but I'll do my best. There was a smaller ladder laying across the ropes in the corner. And these two guys were brawling on top of a super ladder that was set up in the middle of the ring. And they somehow managed to tip the ladder over from there towards the smaller ladder. They both landed on the smaller ladder. And somehow they got to their feet on it. And Jeffy twist of fate on there. So both guys fell on the ladder. And then both men and the ladder fell off the ropes to the arena floor. Yeah. That was so crazy. There's no way to control anything in that spot. You have to hope you land on the ladder, you have to hope you can get to your feet, and you have to hope somehow that as you take this move on to the ladder, you will fall to the arena floor safely, which apparently they did. So uh, they did that, and I, thought, I think that was the finish, and then Jeff just uh, jumped back to the ring, climbed the super ladder, and won. And uh, especially when you know, I watched this whole match, so I was well aware of the beating they took. But then when I watched the highlights afterwards, then you just watched giant fall after giant fall. They killed each other. So uh, it was, you know, they killed each other to have a good match and it worked. Visually, I guess when uh, they came through the curtain, Austin Aries looked the worst for wear. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jeff felt it more. I don't. I'm not Jeff Hardy, but I'll say that I probably wrestled 500 matches in my life. And I didn't do any of this stupid stuff. Took a lot of bumps, but nothing this stupid. And once a month, I... At least once a month, I go to the chiropractor so he can realign my pelvis. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I'm feeling pretty good, all things considered. But I still need my pelvis realigned. And uh, he's always saying, try not to take any throws. You know? Any judo throws it's or anything. It's a good rule for and, everyone, by the way. Jiu-jitsu, yeah. So I try to avoid taking throws because it knocks my pelvis out of alignment. But the point is, this dude's pelvis, his pelvis and his hips and his back and his neck. Yeah. Oh my Shoulders. god. Shoulders. It's like I I know that um, I know that some wrestlers I guess to try to over dramatize things and make them feel tougher will use the line about how every bump's like getting in a car wreck, and it's like I wrestled. For many years, and every bump ain't like getting in a car wreck. Ninety-five percent of bumps are nothing, but some bumps are like getting in car wrecks, and some bumps are like getting hit by semi trucks. And a couple of these bumps that Jeff took, like the one on uh, the one when he got kicked off the ladder and he landed like on his neck and shoulder, yeah, head and, and shoulder first, yes, and got all twisted. That dude's pelvis is out right now, and his back and, and his uh, fucking neck, his neck. That was like getting hit by a truck. And that ain't good for you. So, well, I don't care how they felt when they came through the curtain. They're like, hey, I'm fine. Hey, great. Yeah, good match. Man, that uh, that thing. What the fuck? Was... But listen, this ain't going to be good. And uh, it's not worth it for 7,000 people on pay-per-view. That's the key. That's true. If you're going to do one big match and take one big bump at a WrestleMania that you hope is going to be in the highlight package on Raw 100 years after you die, knock yourself out. Not literally, but you know what I mean. But on a TNA turning point paper, this wasn't even bound for glory. This was even TV. You're gonna get seen by a million people. But uh, turning point, no one's buying the turning point DVD. No one's buying it on Blu-ray because they don't do Blu-rays. No one's. I mean, the, the seven thousand people saw this. Maybe over the course of history, another seven thousand will see it. Don't kill yourself for this. It's it I honest to God, I promise you it's not worth it. I promise you it's not worth it. This is different from Jerry Lawler and his his angle, where I just at the beginning of the show said, Jerry Lawler wants to do it, let him do it. But this is different. It's a physical thing. Yeah. And and I've never met a guy who couldn't walk that was like, Man, I'm glad I can't walk. Never. It doesn't happen. So this is just too much. That's my opinion, at least. 
All right, Impact. James Storm came out to cut a promo celebrating his win. Robert Roode interrupted. This feud will never, ever, ever end. And it's not the only one. Roode pointed out the Storm had beaten AJ. He had never beaten Roode. They got into a brawl. Roode bailed. Storm dared her to come back for more. And Roode said, only if you put up your number one contendership. Storm said, no, I've worked too hard. So Roode threatened to wait until James Storm's daughter turned 18 and then fuck her. As we said. Not in those exact well, not fuck words. Her, but, uh, this, this made James Storm angry. He accepted Bobby Roode's challenge. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of people out there that will tell you Hulk Hogan is a bullshitter, a liar. We watched a segment here where he said that he felt bad for AJ since he couldn't get a title shot for another year now, but AJ was his own worst enemy. You booked him in the match! Yeah. You are full of shit! <laughs> Your character is full of shit. You are not the only one, by the way. And by the way, what the hell does that even mean? AJ's his own worst enemy. Am I missing like a full week of storylines? I guess because AJ lost a match here. That's the other thing. And we'll get to this about AJ later, but AJ lost one match. Yeah. (laughs) And he can't get a shot for a year. For no reason. They never explained why Hulk didn't want. Because Hulk said here AJ's a main event player. Why did you put your main event player in a situation where he couldn't be in a main event for a year? Buys, brother. Quite often, TNA sucks. Aces and Aids had a meeting in their treehouse. Doc, even though he had taken out Sting and Joseph, Joseph Park, they had not yet let him back into the club. They demanded he turn in his vest until further uh, the status was further determined. And Devon threw a dart at the TNA roster to pick a target. Kid Cash wrestled Rob Van Dam. Mike Tanay explained that it, uh, they had teamed together in ECW, and Kid Cash in that time had learned the secrets of how to beat Rob Van Dam. <laughs> Fifteen years later! Rob's style has not changed much. Well, that is true. He hasn't learned any that, new moves. You actually have a good point there. Uh, so they had a match. There were some, for two guys who've been wrestling for 15 years, there were some clunky spots, but it was fine. Rob won with a frog splash, and that was it. Clucky spots in an RVD match? Shocking. Yeah, I know. Uh, Eric Young was bragging to ODB about his fishing success. He said he would beat Jesse. She said she would win the Battle Royal. Then they played tonsil hockey. Kurt Angle met with Wes Briscoe and Garrett Bischoff to pick one of them to be his tag team partner tonight. What has become of Kurt Angle? This, These are the men he turns to. Well, they've been offering their services for a while now. Yeah. He could have turned them both down and found someone else. AJ's free. I believe this is the first time, by the way, because they've had Kurt, uh, they've had Wes Briscoe show up and talk about things like strip clubs. But this is the first time they actually said, oh, by the way, he's training to be a wrestler. He's just been training with Kurt. Eventually, Kurt picked Garrett to be his partner. Yes, Garrett Bischoff. But he said he had big plans for Wes. We had... Eric Young versus Jesse, the guy from Big Brother, who is totally fine on impact. I realize he's wrestling with Eric Young, and Eric Young is really, really, really good at wrestling. But uh, he fits in completely fine on this show. Yeah. Looks good. Carries himself like a star. uh, Seems to know what he's doing in there. So I'm fine with Jesse. Because I noted in the uh, newsletter this week, from talking to people they were in Ohio Valley with Jesse, actually this was a wrong story. Never mind. You're thinking about Brad Maddox. I was thinking Brad Maddox. Yeah. But no, I, I heard uh, I heard that Jesse was was um, not bad. He's he is like a lot of guys there. They do a lot of tag matches, uh-huh. and uh, unfortunately, they do a lot of tag matches. So these guys need to be retaught how to have singles matches. Oh, that, that was the uh, story that I heard. But he seems like he seems like he has a clue. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's the best way to put it, I guess. So. Uh, they had a match, like I say, it was completely fine. It wasn't even a, a total comedy match. They they wrestled. And the girls got into a brawl. This distracted Eric. And Jesse cut him off, and he won with the funniest stunner ever. He grabs Eric's head with Eric behind him. He points to the sky. He jumps straight up as high as he can, and he comes down and lands on his ass. Yes. And Eric took a giant flying bump, and he landed upside down, just like ODB a few weeks ago, where she was stuck on her own shoulders. He ended up stuck like that, and uh, Jesse pinned him. This was fine. Someone needs to talk to him about 
Hulk Hogan's hips after those leg drops. Oh, there's that. In his lower back. I do like the way, though, that he first points out to the camera, I have very large quads, he says. This leg drop's going to hurt this man. Why do you think people have legs? You can't bounce around on your ass all the time. That's why God gave you legs. That is some deep philosophy there. So don't jump up in the air and land on your ass. You know? Hello? Joe Park begged Hulk Hogan for another match against the Aces and Eights. Hogan snapped, said, you're a lawyer, you're not a wrestler, this is not your calling, you don't belong out there. Park admitted Hulk was right, but he took this to mean that he should go to wrestling camp and train. Wrestling camp! Wrestling camp. (laughs) To which Hulk Hogan replied, that's not what I said. God, I hope they sent him to Lance's school. (laughs) And Joe vowed to leave to train to wrestle and return. If we get skits of this. You know what I wish... He needs to do one day in every school in America. No, better. Well, I wish he would just go to Tulalip and have a match with you. I do, too. Put that on impact. I... It's too bad they're not doing World of Hurt Season (laughs) 3, and they could swing a deal where Joe (laughs) Joe Park Park is is on there. As Joe Park? Yeah. Yeah. 12 episodes with Joe Park. (laughs) Oh, God. that That is genius, Brian. That, I will say, is your best idea ever. Well, the problem is no one can see the show. Yep. Even even more fantastic. Yeah. Joe and Magnus were going to wrestle again for no particular reason. Even though they've wrestled a hundred times and Joe just beat him clean with his finish at the pay-per-view Sunday. Fortunately, it was not actually a match. Magnus walked down to the ramp. The aces and eights attacked him. Doc hit him in the knees with his hammer. As this attack is going on, the announcers spend several, well, several seconds, almost a minute, discussing how Nobody knows what the Aces and Nates agenda is. That's why it sucks. <laughs> it's been more than six months. They're just a bunch of dudes in bandanas who beat people up for no reason. Why should we care? Bully Ray and the agents. Pat Kenny, as you noted, was out there. They uh, chased the bad guys away. We had highlights of the ladder match in the pay-per-view. Completely insane. Post-match interview with Jeff, talking, uh, putting Aries over. So then they're backstage at Impact. Aries is saying that... Uh, he said he was not Jeff, is what my notes say. I'm not sure what that meant. But the point is, he ran into Jeff at the massage table. Multiple meanings. Yeah. He ran into Jeff at the massage table, and he cut a promo on him saying he had lost in Jeff Hardy's specialty match. He was not done with Jeff. That's what he said. I left out the words done with. He said he had lost to Jeff, but it was in Jeff's match, and he had brought the best out of Jeff. And finally, he said, you're probably more sore than me. You deserve this massage more than I do. And he left. And then we got Jeff Hardy's thoughts. And the camera went into slow motion. This gimmick. As we could read Jeff's brain. Which, by the way, I don't want to do anyway. But... Jeff watched Aries walk away, and we heard him say, and by the way, Jeff Hardy's brain is apparently a very boring place. He speaks in a dull monotone. But there was something about how Aries had entered Jeff's dimension and then left it without the world title. Can somebody please explain to me why I can read Jeff's mind when I watch this program? Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't watch much football, but can you read the minds of the quarterback? I can't. Hmm. Perhaps I'm doing it wrong. Although, to be fair, sometimes the quarterback does move in slow motion and replays and whatnot. We had Kurt Angle and Garrett versus Devon and a masked man. The masked man was probably Mike Knox. He was big. Remember earlier I was talking about how impressed I was with Jesse? Garrett is still Garrett. Yeah, Jesse was way better than Garrett. Yeah. So, uh, all right, so Garrett gets taken out. Aces and eights all are, are are all over the place. So one dude's got Kurt's arms behind his back, and the other dude's going to hit him with a hammer. And the ref's got his back turned. Wes Briscoe runs down with a pipe, and he jumps in the pipe, pi- uh, jumps in the ring, and he swings the pipe. Uh, he missed, but the ref heard this noise. He turns around. He sees at least two men who are not in the match, two of whom are also welding illegal weapons, and he just stands there. Oh, look at that! He says, cheating. There's more chaos. Kurt wins with a low blow and a schoolboy. This was stupid. Beating the ace and eights. Left and right. <laughs> Our invasion angles is that difficult. Bischoff booked one right for a little while. 
years. Well, a year. Yeah. This was good for like a week or two. Tara and Jesse went to Brooke Hogan's office. They did not knock. They just walked in and they found Bully and Brooke sitting on a, sitting on a couch together. Just sitting there. Bully stood up and without saying anything, he walked out of the room. Tara was upset that Brooke had booked a battle royal without consulting with her first since she was the champion. Brooke said something about how Tara needed to worry about who she was going to wrestle. Isn't that Brooke's job? Yeah, she was busy having her breasts fondled, apparently. She did stand up and adjust her bra. Valeria Smooth. Dixie Carter did a backstage promo about AJ Styles. Talking about how he needed to find his focus. I dropped a pen on the thing while I'm talking. Speaking of focus. Well, all I could all I could focus on in this segment was her hat. She's wearing a knit hat on top of her head. This is a woman in her 50s who dresses like she's in junior high. We had the top contenders battle royal. Gail Kim, Madison Rain, Mickey James, ODB, and Miss Tessmacher. They explained very casually in the middle here of the entrances that uh, Mickey had come back from surgery to remove a large benign mass. That's scary. So the battle royal happened. Uh, Tess Mocker, as you pointed out, was eliminated when she tried to rub her vagina into a girl's face. Yep. Don't blame us. That's what happened. So ODB and Mickey teamed up and ran wild. Uh, Madison Rain got dumped after ODB spat liquor in her face. Then ODB and Mickey bumped into each other and Gale dumped ODB. So it was down to Mickey and Gale. And at this point, it was the most heated thing on the entire show. And they had a singles match for a little bit. And then Mickey put her on the apron and knocked her off with a high kick. By the low standards of Battle Royals, this was actually pretty good. It was right. Most Battle Royals suck. This, well, this, this, this sucked less than most Battle Royals. Most Battle Royals don't have someone being eliminated after ramming their vagina into someone's face. <laughs> I have I, That's a new one. I will grant you that. James Storm was cutting a promo backstage about uh, shutting Root up. AJ walked up and stared at him. Storm asked him, like, what do you want or something? And AJ walked away and the Storm walked away. We're back in the treehouse. They announced that uh, despite Doc's best efforts, he was out of the gang. Told him to head out the door. He was pissed off, but he was also outnumbered, so he wasn't going to start a fight. Then when he opened the door, his vest was hanging there, and they all laughed and slapped him on the back. He put his vest back on, and he's back in the gang. They ribbed him. Yep. That was a good swerve. It actually made sense. It did, it did. Uh, AJ came to the ring all sad. He recapped his shitty year of shitty angles and really good matches and one match he lost. So Kaz and Daniels come out. He agreed it had been the worst year of his career. Said it was all his fault and he was a failure. AJ said he had been beaten Daniels many more times than he had lost. Challenged him to a match. Kaz said, and these were his exact words, AJ is stale and Daniels would not benefit from wrestling him. <laughs> what a great heel. He may as well have said there's no money in it. So Daniels disagreed. He accepted AJ's challenge and that was that. Aries did a backstage promo talking about majoring in psychology, learning about nonverbal communication. He vowed to call somebody out next week that would help him, help him quote, get to the truth. The truth about what? I have no idea what he's talking about here. Angle met with the gut check judges. He begged them to give Wes Briscoe a shot. They kind of, sort of agreed. Kind of. Sometimes I, I uh, get infuriated with TNA storylines. And sometimes I, I appreciate the fact that I pay attention and they're trying. As I've mentioned many times, unlike WWE where Vince... Honest to God, has had the script rewritten and it's not even done until Raw is on the air. And they book week to week and they change her mind like 80 times. On Impact, they actually do write long-term storylines. Like, I don't know what it is, but I know they have a long-term storyline with AJ Styles. Now, the problem is you've got Hulk Hogan who comes in at the end of the day and just changes everything at the last minute. Literally, the last two long-term storylines they've done... For Bound for Glory, he's changed at the last minute. That's twice now. 
Actually, this mo- this most recent Bound for Glory wasn't the last minute, but he still changed it. Anyway, my point is, if you remember months back, they were s- they were planting the seeds for D'Lo Brown being part of Aces and Eights. Because when they were trying to figure out what to do with these guys, D'Lo's the guy that was like, let's just let him in. And everybody else was like, oh, we got to lock him out. We got to get rid of him, blah, blah, blah. And D'Lo's like, no, let him in and we'll fight him. So... If you've been following along, this thing here, I think most people are aware that Wes Briscoe is part of Aces and Eights. He's the guy with the long hair. So, Kurt is trying to get this guy a gut check match, and Bruce Pritchard's like, nah, I don't know, we got a, we got a way that we got to set this up, and, and Al Snow's like, man, you know, Kurt, I know he's training with you, but I don't know. And then uh, D'Lo's like, nah, he's a blue chipper, give him a shot. He's trying to get him in. So actually, if you pay attention to the storyline, you actually are getting paid off here with this particular aspect of it. Delo's in cahoots with these guys, as is Wes, and they're going to screw Kurt Angle. And it all makes sense till Hogan screws everything up at the end. I thought the dude with the long hair was that one English guy. The English guy? There's an English X Division guy. For like He showed up like two shows a year ago. Maybe it's Wes. I don't know. It's Wes. All right. It's Wes. Yeah. You would know more than I would. I just thought I read that in one of... I thought... I forget his name now. It may, he may be playing one of the guys, but uh, Wes Briscoe, I'm 99% sure, is going to end up part oh, sure, of Aces sure. and Aids. Yeah. So, main event time. Rude versus Storm with the number one contendership on the line. Not much to say about it, except it was a very good TV main event. Rude threw him into an exposed turnbuckle behind the rest back. Pinned him with a schoolboy and a handful of tights. So... While they may, they did an entire uh, segment devoted to AJ being the biggest loser in the company, in fact, James Storm is the biggest loser in the company. This poor guy. Has been proven over and over and over again. This is like, I think this is an example of, of whoever's writing this particular storyline can't see the forest from the trees. Maybe when you're there all the time and you're writing all these stories, it what you see in your head is different than what everyone sees when they watch at home. If you're just a viewer and all you do is you watch this show every week, God, this James Storm is a loser. Yeah. It's not even so much because I figure that he's going to end up getting his title shot. I figure it's probably going to be a three-way at the pay-per-view. He's going to get the chance to get back in there. But that's beside the point. The point is he's a baby face and he let the heel get under his skin with a bullshit line. And he was dumb enough to accept the guy's challenge. And when he did, by the way, the announcers pointed out, Rude just played him like a fiddle. That's true. That wasn't the exact word, but it was something like that. Close. Rude Rude just did what he does best or something like that. Meaning, the heel outsmarted the babyface to get what he wanted. So your babyface looks dumb. Then he goes into the match, and lo and behold, he gets beaten. So it doesn't matter if he gets back and he gets that title shot again at this uh, pay-per-view or whatever, this guy has failed over and over and over and over and over and over again. Every single time he fails. Think about this. James Storm won the title, lost it almost immediately to Bobby Roode, like days later. They do a long build towards lockdown, and they focus all of the promotional efforts on him becoming champion in his hometown at lockdown. It doesn't matter if Hogan changes his mind. It doesn't matter what backstage mechanicians went down. All that matters is fans saw this guy week after week on television vow that he was going to win the title in his hometown in the cage. And guess what? He failed. Then it was the road to bound for glory. He got a 20-point head start in the tournament. And what happened? Hogan came in and changed his mind after the guy got a 20-point head start. So, he got a 20-point head start. And again, it doesn't matter what happened backstage, what you were doing if you were actually back there. Four viewers at home, dude got a 20-point head start, failed. Again. He gets his win over Bobby Roode. At the uh, at Bound for Glory, and then at this last pay per view, he wins a title shot, and lo and behold, days later on Impact, like an idiot, he puts that title shot on the line, and guess what? 
he fails. This is a repeated pattern of failure by this supposed top baby face. And if you wonder why James Storm is just a guy on impact and his matches get just a reaction, and granted, the Bound for Glory match had great heat and was a great match, but I mean, when you're both pouring blood and you look like you just got a machete fight, yeah, the people are going to get into it. But the point is, this guy had the potential to really be something in TNA, and now he's just another dude on the roster. And I'm, I'm sure they've got what they think are great plans in mind for James Storm, but dude, this guy's done at this point, to me. Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe in six months he's going to be like the by far biggest star on the roster, but most likely in six months he's going to be just a guy having matches. And that's too bad because they could have done something with him. And the day's going to come when his contract is is coming up. And uh, and same with Bobby Roode has also been uh, had the rug pulled out of him God knows how many times. And uh, who knows what they'll do. But I'd bet WWE would take him. And if they do... If these guys leave TNA, I don't know what to tell you. That's my rant. No, they've 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 they've, they've cut his nuts off repeatedly. He has no nuts left. There's no nut left to cut off. Uh, cutting off nipples now and. All right, let's do Impact. Something I'm very thankful for. What a show! <laughs> this show was amazing. The gimmick was they brought back all the gut check winners to wrestle. Most of them suck. So it was two hours of amateur amateur hour matches and then a lame, lame, lame main event angle. On that note, the show opened with Wes Briscoe versus Garrett Bischoff. This. <laughs> I swear to God, all, this is true. Okay, right, right. I, uh, as soon as this match started... I see Wes Briscoe in the ring. He looks good. He's tan. He's, uh... Anyway, so I immediately sent a text to uh, this buddy of mine, and I said, uh, why was Wes Briscoe fired? Because I was baffled. Then, about two minutes later, I sent another text that just said, never mind. <laughs> Question so, answered. Yeah. So uh this guy's a nephew of Jack Briscoe. And they cut him. You you have to be pretty bad to be Jack Briscoe's nephew and get cut. So, first of all, the idea that, you know, the idea of gut check is that you have to challenge and defeat a veteran on the uh, Impact roster to get a contract, and the veteran he had to challenge and beat was Garrett Bischoff. Oh yeah. And I watched this, and I, I I couldn't believe this was actually happening. That I was watching Garrett Bischoff wrestle Wes Briscoe as Kurt Angle was on the floor watching. And for seconds or so, it was not bad, but I knew doom was inevitable, and so I could not tear my eyes away. I just knew something terrible was going to happen. And then Garrett grabbed a headlock, and at the same time, both men just kind of fell down to the side. Mm-hmm. This was the two, at the time I wrote, the two greenest guys on the roster, although that was not true by the end of this night. They got a stunning amount of time for, uh, well, for two green guys who should not be given this much free time on national TV. And uh, finally, Wes won with what I think was supposed to be Kofi Kingston's SOS, only it sucked. And uh, so he won, so presumably, I guess he gets a contract, or he has to find out, maybe they still do judging next week. I hope so. <laughs> but... This was really bad. Kurt jumped in the ring. He was very excited. I, I I cannot believe Kurt Angle is stuck with Garrett Bischoff and Wes Briscoe. This can't be his idea. Well, they're both going to turn on him, I'm sure, as part of Aces and Eights. God. Be my guess. Could be wrong. Could be wrong. Al Snow gave a speech to all the gut check winners. You were on the show to challenge people. Angle met with Bischoff and Briscoe backstage. He was congratulating both on their match. Said it was an excellent match, but he said they need to slow down and to listen to the fans. <laughs> Among things. That's what he said. Best to just give advice in small doses. <laughs> slow down and listen to the fans. He should have told them that that would give you higher star ratings. He should have given this... Uh, well, actually, he did give the speech before the Alex Silva match. He should have given it to them. Clearly, they were not listening. Joey Ryan versus Chavo Guerrero. 
Joey calls out Chavo and says he and Matt Morgan are going to be the next tag team champions. So they're having a match, and Chavo goes up for the frog splash, and Matt Morgan hits the ring. Not a DQ. Didn't really bother me. Seen it a billion times in Impact. Then he grabbed Chavo Guerrero by the throat yep. and began to choke him. Yep. This was still not a DQ. Yeah. Then he carried Chavo Guerrero around the ring while depriving him of valuable precious oxygen. Still not a disqualification. Yeah. And then finally he chokes land him. At this point, the referee could take no more. I can take no more of Joey Ryan's hairy chest that he oils. Let's it, go away, Heat, for me. His gimmick is that he is disgusting. This, he, this is like, here's the problem, gimmick. though. That's really disgusting. So everybody that has to get in the ring with that guy has to get in the ring with a guy whose chest is hairy and he oils it up. Who did you wrestle that did that? Nikki Six. That's right. That's right. Yeah. He didn't understand this. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's your chest that's greased. Let's switch roles here. Let's pretend my chest was hairy and greased. Now, I'm going to put you in a headlock so your face rubs all over it. Now, do you, what do you think about that? He wouldn't have liked it. This is just disgusting. I do not approve. Ari said he would call someone out tonight, and that would be a family affair. Sam Shaw wrestled Alex Silva. Yeah, and you wonder why I came into the show in a grumpy mood. So Shaw comes out first. He says he's going to call out the first gut check winner. And he announces Alex Silva's name, and it got no reaction because he has not appeared on TV in like six months. All right, where to begin? <laughs> the, the leg drop is where to begin. The leg drop is an excellent point to begin. There was a spot in this match. Mm -hmm. Silva had the heat. I guess he was the heel, although it was very hard to tell. Oh, he was easily the far more hated of the two. <laughs> he So he either was the heel or, or he's miscast. So he's uh, working him over, and he, he's got him down to the mat, and he goes to the corner, and he says, this is the finish, or something like that. Finish it? That was finish it. it? That was it, yes. And he goes, and he does a, goes to a jumping leg drop. Exactly like Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Uh, well, he's about no. 150 pounds. And not, not exactly like Hulk Hogan, because when he, he goes for this move, and he goes to this leg drop, and then he puts both wrists down. A guaranteed way to break your wrists. This happened. On an ICW show. Some dumbass. It was Fender Gibson, I think. He chose to do a, a leg drop from the rafters of whatever tent we were in or whatever barn in Shelton. And he put his wrist down and he broke the damn thing. If you don't put your wrist down when you do leg drops, people, you'll hurt yourself. Obviously, this is not out of the rafters, but still. So he misses his leg drop, which he said would finish it. Sam Shaw rolled out of the way. And... Alex Silva and his ass and both wrists hit the mat. And you would think, okay, this is a transition point. Now Shaw will make a comeback. Nope. Silva jumped up and just kept hitting him. Yeah. Now, we have not yet gotten into their physical appearance. <laughs> and I do not mean their physiques. Silva's out there. He's got wrestling trunks on with the drawstrings hanging out the front. He has knee pads around his ankles, what appear to be Converse shoes, and Shaw has like chartreuse and teal skater shorts with a t-shirt hanging out of the pocket. They could not have looked any more indie -rific. This wasn't even indie -rific. An indie guy would at least tuck his strings in, <laughs> That's and he'd, a fair pull, he'd pull his knee pads up. That's a fair point. This Alex Silva... He's got his shorts on. The drawstrings are hanging out. Uneven, I might add. His knee pads are down around his ankles. And he's sauntering a lot. And then, as noted, at 150 pounds, he tried a leg drop, which apparently was his finish. And when the other guy moved, he just got right back up and kept beating on him. Yeah. This match infuriated me. <laughs> it was, this was the example of two guys... Who have seen some moves and think they know how to put a match together. Actually, I had no, I had no problem with uh, Sam Shaw. He did nothing but sell, and then he made a, a perfectly logical, rational comeback and won. Silva. 
I couldn't handle Silva. When I had matches this bad, and I had matches this bad, when I had matches this bad, Tim Flowers would send guys out from the back to beat up both men. Yeah, with chairs. Yeah. Not saying that should have happened not, here, but that should not have. But I will also point out this show was not live. Like, was Alex Silva thinking like this was like a good idea? I'm going to stand out by pulling my drawstrings out of my trunks and pulling my my uh, my knee pads down around my ankles and sauntering a lot. He stood out all right, and it was not in a good way. It was in a thank God he won and we never saw him again way. No buys. It's funny because when they came out, I assumed that perhaps they had been working together a lot in OVW. They need to work together more in OVW. They need to work together less. Maybe that's it. They need to both work with Doug Williams every day for the next six months and then try working with each other. That's a good point. That's a good point. Eric Young and ODB went into Hulk Hogan's office for a segment that flabbergasted me. The deal was that Eric wanted to have a turkey soup match because it's Thanksgiving. And Hulk said, it's open fight night. You can call out whoever you want. And that was it. But the thing is, because the Eric Young and ODB, they were constantly making sex references. When ODB said that she liked breast meat or something. And there's something else in there about stuffing her. And every time they made these comments, Hulk would chuckle and go, oh, I know what you mean. And all I can think was... This man is in a very real, very public legal battle over a sex tape. This is not how I would be behaving on national television if I were engaged in a legal battle over a sex tape. Well, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon, Minnie. He also, well, that's also true. He uh, also said that he wanted to be Eric when he grew up. Hulk Hogan wants to be Eric Young. When he grows up. When he grows up. They did a wacky skit where Eric met uh, Big Brother Jesse and Robbie E. And he decided to challenge them both in a three-way turkey suit. And after he leaves, Jesse and Robbie E. had apparently just met for the very first time. And they were fast friends from the moment they saw each other. They're actually a fantastic duo. There's a very long Aces and Eights recap video. They threw a dart. They picked a new target. Christian York called out Jeff Hardy. Jeff Hardy was wearing orange face paint here that was still not as orange as Christian York's fake tan. York, at one point, attempted a wacky submission, but he's so over-muscled, he couldn't get the leg scissors on right. He's not flexible enough to do this hold anymore, but he did it anyway. It was a good match. York even got to hit a near fall off a twist of fate, and then finally Hardy hit the senton and won, and he was posing the ropes, Bobby Roode hit the ring. He laid out Christian York with a spine buster. Jeff Hardy did not notice this. And then Jeff turned around and ate a spear. And Roode vowed to regain his title at the pay-per-view. And this is the last time we saw the world heavyweight champion or the top contender on this television program. Brooke Hogan. Oh, no. Brooke Hogan gave Taylor Hendricks a pep talk. <laughs> first, Advice on performing. <laughs> first thing she said did was to call her Tay-Tay. She told her, God brought you here for a reason. That's a quote. Yes. God, God brought you here. God brought you here for a reason. To impact wrestling. She then told her to, also a quote, use the nerves as adrenaline. Yeah. Change one into the other. Use the nerves as adrenaline. Taylor Hendricks versus Tara with Taryn Terrell as ref. First thing, uh, I would be fine with watching Taylor's entrance on Impact every week. She's happy and hot. She called out Tara. They were facing off about to wrestle, and then Taryn Terrell decided it was time to ring the bell. So she jumped up and down as high as she could several times while doing like a tomahawk chop motion with her arm. Yeah. Straight out of cheerlead. Yes. So then the match began. And I've seen a lot of wrestlers with a lot of stances. <laughs> some realistic, some cartoony, some just trying to look cool. 
Taylor Hendricks put up her dukes. She looked like the <laughs> kickboxer from uh, Bloodsport. I was gonna say she looked like a she looked like a boxer from the 1880s. Yeah. <laughs> or she looked like she was about to fight Bugs Bunny in a cartoon. So they had a match. It was poor. Taylor Hendricks about broke her neck running the ropes. She did at one point throw a hell of a high round kick. That was actually really cool. And eventually Tara won with a widow's peak. And so Taylor Hendricks will disappear for six months again. We had the turkey suit match. Eric Young versus Jesse versus Robbie E. This is fabulous. <laughs> this is awesome. This was the best thing on the show. So Jesse has an entrance video. <laughs> it says Jesse. Yeah. Then it says Tara. And then it says Jesse Tara. Then it loops. Yep. <laughs> it says this over and over again. I wonder if you can get this on iTunes. <laughs> I can't imagine why not. Or YouTube. So Eric is uh We're not fans of his comedy in general. His wrestling is really awesome. I love Robbie E's wrestling and his comedy, and uh, I decided I'm a fan of Jesse. And in this match in particular, he fit in just fine with him. Yeah. So the heels double-teamed Eric for a while. I'm sad that Eric is leaving I, right as he's the best he's been in a decade. Yeah, it, it sucks that he's gone because based on this match, I want these three men to feud forever. They double-teamed Eric for a while. They then posed together. And then they started going for pins, and they turned on each other. Tara got involved, ODB got involved, Robbie T got involved, and finally Eric pinned at Jesse with an O'Connor roll. So Jesse had to put on the turkey suit, and everyone had a hearty laugh. And then ODB and Eric were left in the ring, and suddenly the aces and eights appeared. They dragged ODB outside and handcuffed her to the post. And they, uh, they beat up Eric, and they hung his foot over the apron and whacked him in the ankle with the uh, hammer several times. And that was the end for Eric Young. I think someone on this show today asked, what's the motivation of these aces and eights? We don't fucking know. I think they just all go to the impact zone and eat a bunch of turkey and ice cream. Mm. And then they just want to kick everybody's ass. I'm struggling to stay alive right now. I never I never eat like this except like on Saturday night, and I don't have a show Saturday night. Except, I guess, after UFC. But I usually don't eat this much ice cream. Man. So, uh, yeah, Eric was carted out. Oh, by the way, I should point out that the, the Aces and Eights, like eight of them, armed with a hammer and a pipe, they ran away from Al Snow, Simon Diamond, and four twerps and polo shirts. No D-Lo? I, you know, I don't know if I saw d uh, I was, I may have missed it, but I do not recall seeing d Kaz and, uh, Kaz and Daniels came, came out. Daniel said he was challenging AJ to a match at Final Resolution because he wanted to be there in AJ's time of need. And Kaz thanked AJ for proving himself and Daniel's correct, and he called AJ out for a match. It was very strange on this particular episode of Impact to see a good professional wrestling match. Mm -hmm. But that's what this was. And then AJ won with a Pele kick. Yes, the Pele kick. And he got the pin. So AJ, who's being booked as the ultimate loser having a bad year, his one-match losing streak is now over. And then it was time for the main event angle, which I'm looking at my notes here. I can tell you right now, I wrote way too much about this. I was baffled that they didn't uh, beat AJ, by the way. I, I don't know. Because apparently even the losing streak gimmick is too hard to book. You have him lose! So Aries came out. He said the person who had been causing him trouble all year was named Hogan. And so he was going to call out Hogan, but he meant Brooke Hogan. He explained he was not calling her out to wrestle. She came out. He went on a spiel about her private life. Said she probably she probably grew up hoping to one day become Brooke Trump or even Brooke McMahon, which I, I laughed. Then it said, no, she's going to be Brooke Bully Ray or Bully Ray Hogan. And then this became just like the, uh, it was a ripoff of a ripoff. And that this was a ripoff of uh, Vicky showing footage of uh, AJ and John Cena in hotels and stuff. This was footage of Bully Ray and Brooke Hogan in a hallway, which we'd already seen before. And then more damning evidence, I will admit, of uh, Bully Ray in Brooke's office and Brooke adjusting her bra. 
and this resulted in Hulk Hogan storming out. Um, he's slow, so Bully Ray passed him in the ring, and uh, Ares bailed, and Brooke went to the back, and Hulk and Ray had an awkward stare down, and that was the end of Impact, the Brooke Hogan love triangle. Well, Vinny, the fact of the matter is, it's Thanksgiving. Nobody watched this show. There was that. So they put together a show that, honest to God, didn't really matter. Oh, that's fair. And that's exactly what this was. I was entertained at points. I was baffled at points. I felt really stuffed the entire time. And uh, that was that. So, yeah, Hogan and Bully Ray and Brooke and a stuffing. That was the main event. That was the main event of Impact. Proceed, Vinny. Well, I should open my Impact notes then. Yeah, you could probably do that at the beginning of this program. I suppose that's true. Yeah, In fact, I, I, I don't think know about you, it. Do you get charged by the minute that the document is open? The last thing we did was watch Impact, so I don't know why I even closed it. But regardless, I have it open now. It was a dumb show. <laughs> oh, Impact. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm, I'm confident our show is better than this show. I'm not sure after that by play. <laughs> Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Hulk Hogan came out for a promo. He was pissed off. He called out Bully Ray. Bully Ray came out also pissed off. They shouted at each other for a while. Hulk demanded to know what was going on between Ray and Brooke. You know what I love about this storyline? Like, three weeks ago, it was insanely subtle. There was a very, 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 like, split-second shot of Brooke and Bubba together. And now here, three weeks later, it's a full-blown romance. It did escalate quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> so, this was the opposite of Claire Lynch. So, Ray, I don't know why, I have no idea why Bully Ray was angry with Hulk. He asked Hulk if he really wanted to know who the number one man in, her, in his daughter's life was. So, Brooke comes out to make peace between the two men. And Hogan asks her the same question. What's going on between you and Bully Ray? You're still angry. And I thought to myself, you learned about their relationship on Impact last week. In the following seven days, you haven't given your daughter a phone call? Don't think too hard, Vinny. I've, I've learned that over the years. He, I can't help it most of the time, but... He ordered her to... Uh, he said he never wanted to see her with another wrestler, especially not him. Don't know why. They, Bully Ray's been very chummy with Hulk for the past however many months. Well, his daughter is dating a man named Bully. Yeah, that's a fair point. Austin Aries appeared on the screen. He was in Hulk's office along with Kid Cash and Zima Ion and Kenny King, making his big return to Impact. Still employed. What a return it was. What a critical part of the show. They were wondering why Hulk wasn't doing his job. Aries made some legitimately very funny jokes about Brooke lying on this desk. And Hulk stormed to the back. Keep that in mind, everybody. Austin Aries made jokes about Bully humping Brooke on Hulk Hogan's desk. You got that? Right. And it made Hulk extremely angry. Just remember that. We had Gail Kim versus Mickey James. Not their best match. There were points where both girls and the ref appeared to have no idea what anyone else was doing. I like the part where Gail made a cover, and Mickey didn't just kick out. She decided to do a full bridge. So Gail looked surprised by that. Then she tried to hit an elbow strike. Not an elbow smash. She just like tried to drop the point of her elbow into Mickey's abs, but Mickey rolled out of the way. They kept doing stuff. There was a point where they were under the ropes for about a minute. And finally, Mickey won with a move. I don't know what it was. I looked away. They showed no replay. This was an amazingly bad match. An amazingly bad match, but standards have fallen. So I'm sure everybody will say it was fine. James Storm and AJ Styles could have promo bitching at each other. Everyone on the show was pissed off at this point. Hogan stormed into his office. The four men who, like 50 minutes prior, have been making jokes about what a whore his daughter was. Now turned to the same man and begged him for a title match. Yeah, these four guys were all trying to get a shot at RVD's 
title, his television title. And among them was Austin Aries, who, in fact, moments earlier had made a joke about bully Humpin' Brook on Hulk Hogan's wooden desk. This desk that Hogan was now standing behind. Which made Hogan, at the time, extremely upset. So now it was Hogan's job to eliminate the men one at a time to determine who would be rewarded with a title shot against RVD. And guess who he eliminated first? Austin Aries? You're incorrect. That's odd. Kenny King. Kenny King, everyone. He never even took his sweatshirt off. He was dumped for... I, I have no idea why Hulk eliminated him. Actually, Hulk eliminated him because he hadn't done anything lately. And it's like, he hasn't been on the show in months! <laughs> what did you expect him to do? <laughs> Is that breaking news to you that he has not done anything? Bobby Roode came out for a promo. He was making fun of Jeff for being called out by a gut check rookie and then nearly losing to said rookie. Out came the rookie, Christian York. Rude was upset. Told him to take his Rastafarian haircut and, and this is a quote, squeegee looking ass out of the ring. I don't know what that means. I don't have a clue what that would possibly mean. So York slapped him across the face and called him out and they had a match. It was good. Bobby Rude and Christian York. Uh, there's one point where York got a great near fall off when he uh, turned a fisherman suplex into a small package. Rude cut him off, tapped him out with a cross face. A good match. He grabbed a chair, went to cause some more damage, but Hardy hit the ring to make the save, and Rude bailed. Aces and Nates were in their treehouse. They had Christmas lights up. <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh. Devon announced that he wanted what had been stolen from him. The television title. Yeah. Keep in mind that in storyline, in storyline, Devon was the champion, refused to sign a new contract, and walked away. Then he came back as part of a biker gang. That makes no sense. That he would now be upset about having the title stolen from him. Whereas he, in fact, walked out on it. This angle is stupid. Gut check judges talked about Wes Briscoe. And when I say the judges, really it was Taz and Bruce Pritchard having a long conversation. Al Snow stood there deep in thought. I think this was from earlier or last week or something. Because the story is that Al Snow was missing. Yeah, this is from earlier in the day or something, but... Well, I... Okay. The gimmick was, hey, we've talked about it before, Al didn't show up, so D'Lo took, took his place and voted yes. It would have been a lot more effective if Al had been indicating he was leaning towards voting no, so they had to take him out, or, uh, you know, slash his tires, whatever, to make him late to the building. No, Al was just standing there, and they decided they had to take Al out. Yeah. Uh, I missed it. Where the hell are we here? Al Snow, deep in thought. There was a lot of that. Uh, then later in the day, Kurt approached Bruce Pritchard, begged for uh, begged for him to give Wes a contract one more time. D'Lo arrived, and here it was revealed that nobody knew where Al was. Kaz and Daniels versus Storm and AJ. Kaz and Daniels, the best part of this or any other wrestling show. Yes. Daniels' entrance was the best thing on this program. <laughs> by far. He got a new shirt. And uh, he drew attention to this new shirt by saying to the camera, check my shirt out, bitches. Yeah. Then he danced down to the ring. I got to see if he's selling this on his website. The apparently, he included in the announcers to his new shirt. They talked about how it had medals on it. Kaz medals signifying that he was the... Uh, leader of the show, the ring general. Oh, my God. You can buy it? No. I uh, I, I just, I, I don't know his website, so I typed in chrisdaniels.com. Hmm. There's a band, apparently, called Chris Daniels and the Kings. Billboard, apparently wrote about them, breathes there a man or woman with a soul so dead as to never have craved a fix of good old-fashioned, honest-to-God live horns. One of the few acts with enough brass and its gorgonzolas 
to hit the road what? as a full-fledged horn band. Yes, Chris Daniels and the Kings, apparently a full-fledged horn band. How apropos. I was not aware. Google it, everybody. Chris Daniels. Chris Daniels and the Kings. All right, go on while I try and find his website. Fallen Angel Christopher Daniels dot com. So, uh, yes, Daniels had a new shirt. Right. Kaz referred to the fans as butt nuggets. These men need uh, to hold all belts, not just in this company, but in all companies around the world. His shirt is not for sale yet. Although he does have the uh, World Tag Team Champions of the World hashtag shirt with him and Kazarian. Several shirts, actually. The Prophecy Shop. That's what it's called. He also has a uh, a Curry Man t-shirt, a Curry Man tank top. Well, he's a big Curry Man fan. He is a big fan of the Curry Man. Hot, spicy, tastes great. Summertime mm. is here. <laughs> actually, it's not, but... <laughs> you can buy it for next summer. All right, move on. All right. Uh, he deserves a plug. He does. He does. <laughs> Worship me on social media, it says, <laughs> as it plugs his Twitter. Tremendous. So, AJ Styles and James Storm wrestled Cass and Daniels. Oh, also, uh, apparently Cass and Daniels, they said, want to be known as Bad Influence. That is their team name now, I guess. So the story of this match was that AJ was fucking stuff up left and right, and that's, uh, not that he was actually fucking stuff up, that was the storyline, he was missing dropkicks and things. So Storm ran wild, almost won by himself, eventually got cut off, and he made a hot tag to AJ. AJ ran wild, was hitting everything, but then he missed a Pescado. He, he had Daniels perhaps beat, he had the big flying forearm and, uh, had him laid out and could hit him with anything and won, but he chose to try a Pescado on Kaz and he missed that. And they took over on him again. Then he missed his Pele kick, but Storm had had himself in, and he immediately hit Daniels with a super kick and won. So even though Storm had won the match, AJ still came out like the biggest loser ever, which is his gimmick. So at least at least this week, at least this week there was a reason. Whereas last week he won a singles match and was still acting like a loser. His hair. His hair is the hair of a loser. Oh my god, his hair. It's actually awesome. It is the haircut of a, of a man who has given up. I noticed the hair weeks ago, and it's it's becoming more and more pronounced. The problem, if AJ Styles is listening, if you really want to carry this to the max, keep growing your hair as, as floppy as possible, and you've got to also gain a little bit of weight, like get a little fatter. You don't want to get like too fat, because it'll be hard to lose, but... Get a little bit fatter and stop tanning. And then we're talking. And stop shaving your body. I wouldn't go that far. That, that, that's too difficult for his opponents. <laughs> the announced lockdown will be in San Antonio. I assume Ed will be there. It's going to be in the Alamo Dome. A very large building. So Hulk met with the three remaining title contenders. Large was, enough to fit Ed. It is. Zima Ion, Kid Cash, and Austin Aries, the man who was making jokes about Hulk's daughter being a slut. Yeah. Zima made a pasta mania joke. And then Hulk decided that Aries would get the title shot because Rob Van Dam hated him. Yeah, Kid Cash did an impassioned promo about how he deserved this championship match over this great contender RVD, how they'd beaten each other many times in their battles all over the world. It was a hell of a hell of an argument. And then Hogan chose the guy who made a joke about Bully humping his daughter on his wooden desk. Yep. Yeah. Preposterous. And stupid. They're synonyms. Not exactly. Close enough. They're both bad. Samoa Joe backstage promo. He pointed out, in fact, that Devon had abandoned the belt. That's the word he used. He dared Devon to show up for a title match next week. Douglas Williams versus Matt Morgan. This act. Matt Morgan and Joey Ryan are the polar opposite of Kaz and Daniels. Yeah. So, Williams comes out. He's introduced as representing the United Kingdom. Which made me laugh. Ryan's music plays. His video is playing. He comes out. 
to do the uh, ring intros for Morgan. His video is playing behind him. It's a close-up of his own head making goofy facial expressions. It is horrible. He does the intros for Morgan. Morgan comes out in gold and purple gear. He walks to the ring with Joey, who's wearing an open-chested white jumpsuit. They look like the two biggest clowns in the world. This gimmick that Morgan stole Hogan's cape Mm -hmm. from late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. I was four. Mm -hmm. It's preposterous. Yeah. Dare I use my own word again. Yeah. He looks ridiculous in that cape. It's impossible to take these two men seriously. Yeah. Joey Ryan is using every cheap heat trick in the book. He he is playing pro wrestler. And it just comes off so indie. Mm -hmm. Morgan still has the same... It's not new, but Matt Morgan's music is horrendous. Oh, my God. His music is horrible, and he had every Matt Morgan match I've ever seen. And that sucks. And given I've watched a lot of Ohio Valley back in the day, I've seen this match eight million times. Matt Morgan... God bless the guy. I always like to preface it with a a good old God bless the guy. God bless the guy, but Jesus Christ. The whole Matt Morgan story of his career is big guy, allegedly a great athlete, and an underachiever. So I guess the idea now is that now is his big chance. He's re-signed. Hulk Hogan's behind him, and the dude goes out there, looks the same that he always has, does the exact same match he always does, nothing has changed. Buy the numbers, connect the dots, basic, boring Matt Morgan match. I just don't get it. Like, is this business really that hard to figure out after all these years? I just don't know what to say. He has made one change. It is 2012, so he has grown a scraggly beard. That's right. He's add him to the beard list. So Joey Ryan's out there as his manager. And we talked before about how the point of a manager is to uh, accentuate what is going on in the ring. Joey was out there to steal the show. He was in constant motion. And then halfway through, realized that he was... Uh, the ring was between him and the camera. So he moved to the other side so he could be in front of the camera the entire time, doing stuff the entire time, trying to try, just trying to get on camera. This also came off as so indie. This act sucks. Everything about this act sucks. I just gotta say, if Matt Morgan's listening, which I doubt, but you never know. If you keep doing something over and over again and it doesn't work. Why do you just keep doing it? Why do you keep doing it and thinking, this time I'm going to get over? I'm going to do the exact same thing I have been doing for the last 12 years or whatever that has never gotten me over to any degree and has led to me being labeled an underachiever. And I'm just going to keep doing the exact same thing. It's just as mind-boggling to me. You know? But... Now we get another two years of Matt Morgan having the exact same match, doing the exact same promo, looking exactly the same. Nothing ever changes. And I would bet, I've been wrong before, but I would bet in two years, Matt Morgan's at the exact same spot he's in right now, if he's lucky. Might even be out of the company or just a guy. So D'Lo and Bruce were still looking for Al Snow. They were on the phone with his wife. She hadn't seen him. D'Lo volunteered to be the replacement judge, saying he had done all the live gut checks, and Pritchard agreed. So it was time for the West Briscoe gut check segment. Uh, Bruce announced to the crowd that D'Lo was taking Al's place. He mentioned that he himself had beaten Wes's father. I'm sure it's true, but... I, just seems wrong. He uh, noted that last week's match between Garrett Bischoff and Wes Briscoe was not very good. That's what he said, everyone. That match you had sucked. Well, at least I have been uh, vindicated. Well, in fact, all three other judges noted this. 
Everyone thought it sucked. Which begs so many questions. Was it, Were they going out there trying to have a bad match to fit the storyline? Yeah, and no, I think it just played into the storyline that wasn't any good. It, it wasn't a live show. They couldn't have edited it. They couldn't have reshot it. Actually, no. They never reshoot anything. Hmm. So they all buried the match. Uh, Bruce voted yes. Taz voted no. I was kind of hoping that for all the bullshit with Alan and, and, and D'Lo that both judges would just vote yes anyway. <laughs> His vote would be wasted. They let Wes cut a promo. He got very over-the-top teary-eyed about what this would mean to his family, especially his Uncle Jack, and he looked to the heavens and, and began to weep. And uh, finally, D'Lo voted yes. The fans were happy, and Kurt Angle and Garrett Bischoff came down, and they celebrated with Wes. And I have two questions. First of all, the idea that you... <laughs> you wrestle a guy to prove you deserve a contract, and uh, it doesn't matter if you win... And apparently it doesn't matter if you even have a good match. Either way, it's just up to the judges. That's stupid. Two, wasn't there a segment two or three weeks ago where Kurt needed a tag team partner and Wes was begging Kurt to pick him? And he picked Garrett instead? That's correct. So Wes didn't have a contract, but he was going to be his partner anyway? Yeah. Okay. Here's my issue with this. So here's what I do like. I do like that it appears that uh, D'Lo Brown is a member of Aces and Eights and has been for a long, long time. And if you've been following the storyline all the way back, they've been consistent with this D'Lo thing for months and months and months. And I don't think, honest to God, most of the fans have figured it out yet. None of them. So, obviously, this all makes sense. You you had to get rid of Al Snow to make sure you had D'Lo in there. To make sure that, uh, if needed, D'Lo could give the deciding vote to get Wes Briscoe his contract. Because Wes Briscoe also is a member of Aces and Eights, is the uh, belief. Here's the problem. Why did Wes Briscoe need a TNA contract? I don't know. Aces and Eights are allowed in the building. Yeah. He could cause all the mayhem he needs to without being under contract with TNA. That's true. This would have made a hell of a lot more sense... If, in fact, this had all gone down before Ace and Ace had won the right to come into the building anytime they wanted. Because then you would answer the question of who's unlocking the door. Now, granted, D'Lo could have unlocked the door as well. But it would have made more sense that D'Lo's trying to get his guys into the building easier. And this was his way to do it by getting this guy a contract with TNA through gut check. But now that Ace and Ace have already been allowed into the building... What the fuck difference does it make whether Wes Briscoe has a contract or not? I don't get it at all. Because apparently Wes Briscoe has been there virtually every week as a member of Ace and Eights. He's got it just fine. So I don't know. And again, they all admitted last week's match was no good. Yeah. Bully Ray confronted Hulk Hogan. He was pissed off that Hogan had given Aries a title match. They accused each other of confusing business with personal. That's their exact words. Jeff Hardy is going to be a show on Ink Master where uh, amateur tattoo artists experiment on him. Don't let this happen to you, everyone. <laughs> By the way, I googled Gerald Briscoe versus Bruce Pritchard. Zero matches. Bruce Pritchard versus Gerald Briscoe. Zero matches. Jerry Briscoe versus Bruce Pritchard. Zero matches. Jerry Briscoe versus Brother Love. Zero matches. I have absolutely no idea what Bruce Pritchard was talking about. If anybody can find an example of, of Jerry Briscoe and Bruce Pritchard wrestling, alert me. Preferably with video. We had an ODB backstage promo. You'll recall that last week the Aces and Eights had removed her husband from the company, apparently. And uh, she explained calmly that they had destroyed her husband's ankle. Then she said she was so distraught she could not talk and she walked away. I was hoping that if they actually wrote Eric Young out of storyline, because his contract expired, that they would go backstage to a very sad, morose ODB, and she would explain that Ace and Ace had, had destroyed her husband's leg, and he'd never be the same, and he'd probably never be seen around these parts again. So, time to move on! Bam! And that'd be the end of that storyline. That would have been more convincing. 
Yeah. ODB is not the best actress when she is not playing ODB. I probably just woke Rodney out of a deep slumber right there. Hulk Hogan and Austin Aries had a conversation. I couldn't hear it because they were playing the audio from a Jeff Hardy <laughs> Robert Roode promo. Awesome. Rinky Dink Clown Show here on Impact. We had an amazing main event. I knew this match would be awesome. Austin Aries versus Roth Van Dam. Austin Aries, I, I talked about this many months ago. Austin Aries is a guy that uh, management is super high on. They love Austin Aries. The wrestlers, not so much. I talked to a lot of guys that hate working with Austin Aries. Same guys love working with Bobby Roode. Bobby Roode and Austin Aries are said to be like polar opposites. Bobby Roode is a dream to work with, and Austin Aries can be a nightmare. This is not to say that Austin Aries has bad matches, but uh, that's just the word that a lot of people don't like working with Austin Aries. And uh, Rob Van Dam is a guy who can be very clumsy. Uh, he's just going to do what he wants to do. He's going to hit you. He's going to bump into you. Something's going to go wrong. And you put these two forces together, and fun. <laughs> fun ensues. That's what we got here. It was two irresistible objects colliding. Oh, my God. And when I say colliding... There was a lot of collisions. <laughs> there was a point where Austin went for his tope and Rob was on the floor, and then Rob takes it upon himself to jump up onto the apron, and they just went, bonk, and both fell down. And you and Rodney and I all at the same time said... What the fuck was that? And the announcers couldn't figure out what in the hell happened right there. No. So then Rob hit the guardrail. This caused his knee to get stuck in midair. Yes. He did his gimmick where he stands on the apron and he does like a, a jumping, spinning kick. And the guy inevitably moves and he he, he hits the, uh, the metal railing. But this time he hit the metal railing. And so he's got his right leg... On the railing, and his left leg on the ground, and he just begins to writhe, and he acts as if his leg is stuck. Yeah. Now, his leg is not over the guardrail, or wrapped up in the guardrail. It is merely on the guardrail. This happened two times during this match, so I can only presume that he had a giant magnet in his boot. So I don't know why. Aries' response to this was to grab Rob by the head and drag him upside down over the guardrail onto his head on the floor. Yes. Uh, if you like seeing Austin Aries get kicked in the face, this is the match for you. Happened many, many times. They did the spot that Rob does in every match where he gets shoved off the top rope and hits the guardrail on the floor, only Austin Aries pushed him so hard. I thought he was going to do clear of the guardrail. Finally... Aries grabbed a microphone. Keep in mind, this is for the X title shot that Aries had wanted so badly. He, somewhere in the show, he explained that winning this title would be the first step in getting his world title back. So he grabs a microphone and starts to make fun of Rob for being on his back, sweaty and out of breath, just like Brooke Hogan. No logical explanation for any of this. In the middle of the match, he decided, now's my chance to make fun of Hulk Hogan again. This caused Bully Ray to run out and kill him for the disqualification. Which, by the way, made very Aries very upset at Bully. He blamed Bully for this. Not himself yeah. for taunting everyone. Yeah. Which I guess is what a heel should do, but still. He had a long string of slobber hanging from his beard. Hogan came out. His eyes were all bloodshot. He looked awful. He had a stare down with Bully Ray, and the show ended. I loved it, because Bully comes out. Aries is trying to bail. But Hogan comes out, so Ares is trapped between Hogan, who wants to kill him, and Bully, who wants to kill him. And you're sitting here thinking, man, he can't go left, he can't go right, he's on the ramp, he must be trapped. And then he just disappeared. Yeah. And they focused on Hogan and Bully staring at each other. I was like, that was abrupt. So that was Impact, everybody. Not the best show.